So you're going to introduce, you're going to get us. Uh, how, yeah, how we're on talk? now. Hello, everyone. This is Fiber Graywolf of Native Voices Turtle Island TV. And today I have two special guests. I'll let them introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about their bio, what they're about. And then we'll go into some questions. And um, I'm going to also let them take control of much of the conversation because uh, these two young men are very connected. They've been um, brothers for a very long time. They have a lot of history to share and uh, hopefully to correct. All right, on the top, please introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Norris Francis Branham, uh, also known as TurtleGang.NYC. Um, you know, come from a long history of, uh, I guess you could say activism, but you know, my family has participated in what we call this struggle for liberation since the colonizers, you know, since the Europeans first arrived on our shores, you know what I'm saying? And um, I'm just continuing that fight, being that voice for my family and for people who can identify with this. Uh, you know, trying to be a voice for them, uh, just by sharing our story. You know, um, my family is blessed with the, you know, we have much of our history. We recorded it, our contributions to the communities in our area because of our contributions, like, you know, our family history has been recorded by state officials, uh, county officials, town records, you know what I mean? We have a very strong history and our history tells a story that is probably one of the stories, last stories to be told. You know, we, they told the African slave narrative, they told the Native American reservation narrative, but they haven't told the story of those of us who are blend of the two. They haven't told the story of those of us who have been written out of history. Now, People might get upset when I say a blend of the two, but you know, for any of us to think, and I can't speak on other people's families, I can only speak on my history. Like, do I have African ancestry? Yes, I do. Have we identified our most recent African ancestors? When I say recent, I mean within the four, past 400 years. No, we, do, we haven't, through our genealogy, we haven't identified these individuals but I know because of how history is recorded, right? A lot of things can be omitted and left out. You know what I'm saying? But what I do know is that regardless of what African ancestry I have, they lived a native culture here. They were absorbed into native communities and whatever uh, intellectual prowess and abilities and things that they came here with, they incorporated it into the culture that was pre-existing, which would have been our indigenous native cultures. So we're gonna have a blend of the two. For some people, you're gonna have more of a heavy blend towards an African culture or, or, or history. For others, you're gonna have more of a heavy blend towards the native history and the native culture of the lands we grew up in. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of confusion going on out now. People are really exaggerating the truth and they're not being honest with themselves and they're passionate about it and they're speaking on these on their history and they might not necessarily have a full grasp of it now you know myself cheeto pa you know i can speak for him in terms of i've been dealing with pa i've been building with pa for over 12 13 years he's somebody i absolutely met online and I met in the circles, having the conversations we're having now. And this is somebody I met. And in person. <laughs> and in person, yeah, we'll get to okay, that Okay, hold and that. In person. Hold that thought. Let him introduce mm -hmm. himself and what he is about, his heritage, so on and so forth. It's Gamochi. My heritage is Yamasi, and I'm also Shata, and I also have um, Moorish background, well, Moorish Hebrew background um, on the Bartholomew side of my family. 
um, that's on my mother's father's side of the family. Um, but just like Cousin Norris has said, uh, we been more than a decade of knowing each other and seeing one another and building and everything we actually have uh he actually has a documentary when he came down here um in the chapatulas territory which became known as new orleans um and i'm also a blog talk personnel um i was in the blog talk personnel um personality i should say um when blog talk first came out um before that i was doing talk shoot so this was in the early 2000s, right after Hurricane Katrina, uh, which I'm down here in this Norman, New Orleans, Louisiana. So, um, you know, I deal with history and I'm also a of my family in dealing with information, being dealing with being a historian. Um, and I have been, in other words, blessed to have my elders around me growing up. Um, my grandmother and my great grandmother and my father and my grandfather and my great grandfather that knew these stories that was actually passed down orally before there was any internet, before there was any Facebook, before there was any YouTube, before there was anything. You know, we were sitting at the feet of our and of our ancestors or our elders, you know, because we was not allowed to sit up with them in all in the same room with them unless they was teaching. You know, so um, and down here in this Norman, New Orleans, Louisiana, there's something that's called Mardi Gras Indians, but we call it Carnival Indians, but most people call it Mask and Black Indians. And we show the two of the African blend and the American Native blend when they come together and make it like a gumbo, which gumbo is nothing but a shot stew. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, they have culture where we actually took and freed those slaves that came in that was in the Carolinas and in Georgia and Louisiana and, and other states that held, had slaves. You know, they want to speak about the rebellions, but there was actually wars. You know, you had another large one, which actually happened. This is our anniversary dealing with the Yamasi um, of the 350 years of freeing both Indians and African slaves that was in 1715 called the Yamasi War. You know, it happened the Easter weekend, which we are in the Easter weekend where we actually attacked those slave masters, uh, both that was melanated and non-melanated. Now your people, uh, your Yamasi tribe is considered um, the legitimate Yamasi tribe. Um, you guys came out of Florida traditionally, and um, Chief Sekou is in charge of your your nation um, that is recognized yes, by Chief the Sekou. state. Can you tell me a little bit yes. more, more about that? Yes, Chief Sekou, gentle, he is the Bimaku of the Yamasi Muskogee Creek Nation, and we have family that's um, in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, which our territory was way larger than that, dealing with the Upper and Lower, which became known as the Upper and Lower Creek um, Nation and everything, uh, territory. So um, he is the Bimeku, he is the reigning Bimeku of the Yamasi Yati, which is my people. So we've been here, most people want to say, oh, the Yamasi is extinct. No, we never was extinct, you know, so We've been in the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, Mexico, you know, um, and Oklahoma as well. So we have family that's there as well. Yeah, he's mentioned also in a book and uh, museums. Um, what town is he in? Oh, he's right there in in Fairfax. South Carolina or Allisdale County in South Carolina. And yes, he is in the um, South Carolina eighth grade and third grade history book. Uh, he's also on the PBS documentary, which is called The Secrets of the Spanish. He's also in the documentary called By Any Other Names that my picture is on the front when they came down to the reservation. And we I saw that. All over the world. 
Yes, we have yes, been seeing I all saw that. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. It's so cool. He been an advocate for what we know as quote unquote black Indians. You no, know, oh, I, I like the word quote unquote black Indians. I, I don't like that term <laughs> yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. A, a fairly yeah. recent term, uh, what, since William Katz came out? <laughs> well, let, me, yeah. let me say this about the yeah. term because growing up, and I want, I want to get to my uh, heritage as well, but let me just say this about the term. Black Indians became offensive to people once we realize what the, like once we started to be, become educated in what these terms mean in a legalese mm -hmm. perspective, that's when we became offended as in black equals means mm -hmm. death and this and that. But we have to understand that mm -hmm. those are legal uh, classifications. When we say the term casually, I'm a black Indian, black is being used as a description yeah. not as an identity mm -hmm. the identity it would be indian and black would be the description so what yeah. happens is people are getting worked up emotionally over like you have you have to take these terms in context so when my family told us because growing up we was like oh we're black indians and as a child i don't know what to make of that you know what i'm saying other than oh well maybe we got some indian in our family you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but as I began to educate myself and understand how you take things in context, like I'm not necessarily offended by the term black Indian because it's a descriptive term and it's an Indian references what they collectively called the people they found here. Like a lot of times people who don't really have real arguments or real things to say will get caught up in what I call low hanging fruit. They're arguing over, are we Indians? Are we Aboriginal? Are we indigenous? Are we Apachans? Are we the copper colored? I'll ask Cheeto Pa, what are you, Cheeto Pa? I am Yamasi Yati, Yamasi. And I will say I'm Lenape Wak, I'm Muncie. See what I'm saying? I like, and amongst our people, we're gonna have people that are gonna appear black, are gonna appear white, are gonna appear the blending of the two, they're going to appear Asian. We're going to have a whole plethora of phenotypes because people who understand real native culture and understand what really happened to us during colonization will know that during colonization, a lot of us clung together. We came together with other tribal members. We came together with poor whites who were being persecuted. And we came together with Africans who were fleeing slavery, right? So at this point, like we all can look back in our history and find multiple nationalities. But we have to remember that all this took place in specific territories, which reflected the cultures of those people that existed in those territories. So no matter who came into right. Pa's territory, they was in Yamasi territory and they were living a culture right. that would have been developed by them, as was my people. I am Lenape. I am also Kitwa. I have Kitwa Cherokee, right? I come from a community in New Jersey that is a blend of the Lenape, who were here in Jersey, our Cherokee cousins who migrated up here in the 1700s, and the African runaway slaves that we'll get away, we'll, we'll talk about a little later. This is something I want to address too. And we're a blend of those. But all this took place in Lenape Hokan. The languages that were being spoke, the traditions that were being carried out, the things when they, like the people we study in school, when they talk about the New Jersey Indians, this is who they're talking about. They're talking about my people, our people. You understand? So, you know, I could be long winded, but the point I'm trying to make is like, we don't really have to be offended by the term black Indian. It's the description. When you know who you are, you know the difference between a description, a designation, and an identity. So they will call me all right. types of things, Negro, colored, black. They'll call me all these things, right? But I know that I am Lenape. I am Cherokee. You understand? So 
a lot of these arguments are just filibusting arguments. You know what I mean? They're, they're a play on words. And I would like for people to be able to get beyond that so we can have some real discussions. You know what I mean? No. About right. not well, only who we are, but how we got this way. Well, uh, I have a problem with the word in my own personal being because mm -hmm. I feel that once that book came out, it divided us even more. It, it let doors open for even more false history to be taught. You know, uh, before that book, people accepted uh, you as anything like a uh, mixed blood or uh, half breed or, or whatever. We didn't have the term black Indian. And from that term black Indians with that book, it started a whole can of worms with people going amok, teaching false history, um, dividing, getting angry at each other. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just ridiculous. I mean, uh, William Katz, he meant well. This is just my personal opinion. But he wasn't researching um, the different phenotypes. Mm -hmm. You know? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And Do you agree? This, this is why. No, I agree to some perspective but my people we referenced ourselves as black indians long before that book was written you know what i mean so like i i under see this is the thing i think that a lot of people who are influenced by books have a certain perspective people who are influenced by actual real life experiences see it from a different way people who see black indian in books they associate it with uh with, with all the legal you know, aspects of what the term black is. They associate it with uh, African. They associate it with all these things. When when my direct people said we was black Indians, it wasn't being spoken in that term. As I said before, it was being spoken from a descriptive term. You know what I mean? And at that point, we had all been so uh, engulfed in black culture, in black identity, that to be able to say, yeah, we black, but we black Indians. You know what I'm saying? It was a, it was acknowledging the culture and the times that we're in, right? Because I like to say black is not an identity, right? It's It can be a description, but really it's an experience. You know what I'm saying? And it's an experience that Africans have had. It's an experience that Native Americans have had. It's an experience that poor white people have had. You know what I'm saying? Whether they want to admit it or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, so for me, black is- Even some of them was called black. <laughs> yes. So for me, black Even is more the was called black. Right. experience. You know what I'm saying? Like people will say, oh, you're trying to be Indian. You don't want to be black. So what you think being Indian gets me out of that being black don't? Being Indian make it even worse. You know what I'm saying? Like they had no issue with Africans because they had no claim to the land. Say you native, right. that's a whole nother problem, right? So us coming out and saying we want, saying we this, thinking it's gonna alleviate the struggles and the oppression we face as so-called black people or Negroes, it's not. It's just us articulating our true history of who we are. And you know, yes, a lot of things, a lot of mistruths have been taught, you know what I mean? And now it's time for people who really have a connection to up the ante and start holding people accountable because we have a lot of pseudo scholarship out here. Scholarship, not tradition, not heritage, even this whole gene genealogy thing. It's all on paper. I get that genealogy can show you who your ancestors were, but where's your connection to the cultures and the experiences your ancestors was experiencing? You know what I mean? All too often people want to this is my genealogy. Look, I'm a descendant of this chief or this. OK, but are you connected to the culture? And this is not to diminish who, who you are. But being an Indian is more than just saying I'm related to an to this person. It's about the culture. It's about your heart. It's about your mind. It's about how you operate. You know what I mean, it's how you treat people, like how you treat the land. It's, it's, more, it's more than just. My genealogy says my ancestor was this. You know what I mean? And a lot of people are using that as weight to give them authority. You know what I'm saying? 
So uh, uh, other thing is, are you doing ceremony? Like, e like for me, are you even practicing? <laughs> are, yeah, it comes to a point where you have to, if you want to claim this, and I'm not saying this for everybody who has ancestry. I'm saying the people who want to be the influencers, who want to be in the front, in the forefront, and want to be the leaders, they need to start demonstrating that culture. They need to start showing that they're getting into their culture and not just talking about it academically. You know, I mean, that's what the European has done for so long. He's talked about our cultures academically and reduced it to just what you find in books. And now we have a whole generation of people that are coming and reading out those books, thinking that reading what's in them books is now validating them or making them more of something. And, and I'm saying I, that it's, so, it's more than that. Well, getting, you know back I mean? to, um, getting back to Mr. Katz, who wrote the book, I spoke to him years ago. And I asked him, why did you make the book? And he said to me, he was a good friend of my, um, my uh, friend, uh, Chief Osceola Townsend of the Matinecock Nation. And he said, I did it because I wanted children that were African-American to have a right to say they were also Indian, you know, or they had Indian blood. You know, so that mm -hmm. kind of like struck me as, you know, this man is not studying. He hasn't studied through the years. He means well, but um, it's going to open up a can of worms. Um, uh, like what you just spoke of, Norris, um, mm -hmm. all the academics from the, <laughs> the sidewalk, sidewalk uh, college or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And these people are actually leading in the academics of native people but as paul said they are they doing ceremony you know or are they practicing are they being a part of a tribe are they trying to learn from a tribe mm -hmm. you know the inner exactly. inner workings of uh being um a, a native person yeah. you know so yeah. i said this yeah. book is going to cause a you know a whole bunch of <laughs> you know uh uh confusion here and it sure enough has because um Absolutely. people are running with it can you tell me norris who has been attacking you uh, lately and uh, are they pan-african or well, uh, <laughs> so i can say this and cheeto pa i'm sure he can attest to this at this point in my journey the attacks that i got were 10 eight, nine years ago. And a lot of those people that I actually went to battle with are now colleagues of mine, <laughs> right? Because we sat down and like, you know, person can keep testing you and trying you. And if you are solid and you keep coming back, you know what I mean? Like showing and proving what you speak on, all that, all that, you know, the attacking, all that is over with. So I don't necessarily get attacked you know, I, oh, put it this way, the people I get attacked by are people that used to sit on my page five, six years ago and study the things I was saying. Those are the people that are attacking me. Not like I I, I counsel with Delawares. I, I, I talk like we are involved with the Lenape tribes in 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 uh, Canada. You know what I'm saying? We have ties with the with the tribes in Oklahoma. Now, are there are there still confusions and, con and controversies amongst the two yes there is but we're in dialogue been in dialogue with them the people who have issues with me the most now are people who were five six years ago they were rbg they were chemites they were hebrews right and now they are experts in native american culture and they're the ones that come at me the most Oh, the they're the experts five, now. Five, oh, oh, they're the ex oh, oh, they're the experts. Okay. <laughs> yeah, now they're the experts. Yeah. Do they do <laughs> ceremony? Do they <laughs> participate in tribes? Do no, they, they know do the everything. inner workings of? No, what they do, they they spent countless years cultivating an Afrocentric culture. So what they have done over the past few years is try to. Uh, morph that Afrocentric culture into native culture. 
You understand? So, no, they're not. They're not doing none of those things. They haven't made any relationships with any active tribe, tribal communities. They're doing none of these things. All they're doing is reading out of books, and the books they're reading are written by Europeans, and they're using the, they're using European information against real people. And and when I say real people, I'm just saying those of us who are connected to our communities. You know, what I mean, not just internet communities people like boots on the ground were in our communities you know what i'm saying they use these things to attack real communities right and at the same time they say that the european or the white man is lying but they use the information he he presents to attack real communities and then when you question them or when you utilize the same you know okay well i got information from then they go oh yeah but that's the white man but they're using the white man's information. Every bit of information they have is from the white man. And they say they learned it from their grandmother. And did the white man um, do ceremony? Did he live among the tribes as well? You know, they're taking all of this um, knowledge from the white man. They don't get to that part of the book because the because the white man actually went and lived with tribes. He recorded a lot of the ceremonies, stuff he could, some things that he was not allowed to record. But the things he could, he shared. That's how these people know to burn sage and all these other things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not because they've been to uh, any ceremony, because it's low-hanging fruit. It's popular. You know what I mean? It's something that is easily accessible on the internet. So these are the things that they practice, and, and they think it's the full breadth of what culture is. And it's really just the low-hanging fruit. They put on big uh, Plains Indian war bonnets. You know what I mean? And they do all the things that are typical. Um, all these people that attack you, are they strictly believe, do they strictly believe the narrative that all blacks came from Africa? So that's, that's a topic I, I would like to discuss. Okay. So I think that's a loaded question. Because history does not say blacks come from Africa. History doesn't say Africans. It doesn't say Native Americans. Mm -mm. History and science says Homo sapiens sapien comes from Africa. All right. So until so, I'm not dealing with what we call racism or race, any interracial aspects. I'm talking about the species of human that we are. All people on the planet at this point are homo sapiens sapien. They're not Cro-Magnon, they're not Neanderthal, they're not the silo man, they're not early homo sapien. There's 13 different versions or different species of man that have existed, right? Homo sapiens sapien, which translates into the wise man or the thinking man, is the man who survived the cataclysms and the changes on the earth. How he survived them, how he, she survived them is because of our intellect. We are special. We are here now because of our intellect. Our brains are bigger. Our brains work in a more intricate manner. We process more information. We can do more things. We're not just instinctual. And this is why we survived. Long before we became black, white, European, African, Native American, I'm talking about the homo sapien sapien. And all these people who want to, they want to debate out of Africa, out of this, out of that. Listen, if I hear you even using the word African or native or saying all African Americans, I know you're missing the point. I'm speaking about the homo sapien sapien. And until individuals can remove themselves from that category, all the science on the planet points to the fact that Homo sapiens sapien came out of East Africa over 200,000 years ago. And at this point, I'm not debating with any pseudoscientists, nobody who thinks they have a this or that, no. get. Get your boots on the ground, know what you're talking about. Because all the scientists, now when they say things like, oh, these theories have been debunked, what is really happening is 
The theories state that man came out of Africa, let's say 50 to 15,000 years ago, modern man, right? But what they're finding is that modern man exited Africa 200,000 years ago. That's the error. Not that they, de they didn't. So when they see the term debunked, they're not getting into the, into the details of what has been debunked. It's not that the out of Africa theory was debunked. It's the time frame was debunked. It's not that the Bering Strait theory was debunked. It's when it occurred, that's what was debunked. But people, like I said, our people are, they have not been trained on how to critically assess information. And that is the real problem. Now, anybody can say they feel something and they this and that, and I think, and how come this? What does the science say? And the same science that says this is the same science that allows you to get on an airplane and fly from one place to another. Okay, it's the same science that allows doctors to go in and tell if you're going to have cancer or not. You understand? It's all it's the same science. So why are people picking and choosing? Why? Because they have an issue with Africa because it's related to the slave trade. And everybody's running from being slaves. And I'm telling you, you didn't have to be from Africa to be a slave, right? You didn't have to be African. None of these, we all know these things. Slave is not synonymous with African, all right? And all that, oh, it's the Slavic people, that's language. Because slave in another language is not slave. So stop using the term Slav to say only Slavic people, Eastern Euro pe European people are slaves because the term slave comes out of the word Slav. That's, see, this is all the reasoning right. that people use that is, it's not common sense, it's nonsense. See what I'm saying? Like all, all these, like either we're gonna stick to what the science says, right? Or we just gonna make it all up. You know what well, I mean? Well, the, the number the, of, the, I didn't mean to cut you off, but the number of slaves recorded that came here doesn't match their findings at all. No, no, this is the thing. And th this is why, this is what I'm talking about. No, the numbers do. It's just that when they say 12 million slaves were taken from Africa, we automatically think 12 million slaves came to North America. No, only 400,000 at the most. 400,000. Well, that's what I'm dealing with, uh, Turtle Listen, Island per se. The rest went to South America and all across the world. See what I'm saying? This is where people, they're just seeing 12 million and they're saying 12 million didn't come here. No, nobody ever said 12 million African slaves came to North America. This is what people assume because they're not critically reading the information. The information is well- And then, another, and, and then another thing is that they are not looking at the nations that actually participated in mm -hmm. it. You know, the Spanish was the first. Then you had the Portuguese. Then you had the French. Then you had the Dutch. Then you had the English. All those nations have manifest because yeah. dealing with those ships. You have to remember dealing with the time. They keep on talking about all the Atlantic, trans Atlantic slavery didn't happen and it was in reverse. Well, how would you say that it was reversed when the Spanish and them didn't get to the joining islands until the 1400s? And then you had Pasa de Leon and De Soto and them, they didn't make it to the mainland until the 1520s. Mm -hmm. You see? So with all that was going on, you already had the East Coast of Africa already getting hit from the uh, Pale Arabs. And they'll bring them to Portugal, you see? But nobody not talking about that. And on top of that, two African nations have already issued, Ghana is one of them, and another one of the nations on the East has so already- So with all these going on, they're not looking at the timeline. No. See, this is the thing about the all these theories. People want to deny that Homo sapiens sapien I'm never going to say African or native. I'm, I'm going to say homo sapien sapien. Meet me there and debunk that. Show me that science ain't right. All right. If you can't, I don't want to have these discussions. But people do not want to deal with the fact that at some point, 
we dealt with migrations. Everybody deals with migrations. It's a part of our culture and our history. Certain tribes bury their dead facing a certain direction because yeah. they know that's the direction they came from. But people who read books and don't have all this information that might have been handed down to them or passed down to them, they don't know these things. Right? I like right. Like when they exhumed those bodies in the African burial ground in Manhattan, right? These bodies, which they caught, said it was an African burial ground. That burial ground sat dead smack in the middle of a Lenape village. See what I'm saying? Why were there Africans there? Because when the Africans came, when they would flee, they would go live with the Indians. They would go mixing with the Indians, right? right. So you're going to have a, a plethora of Africans being buried. And then when, when the Europeans took over, they just continued burying them in these burial grounds. So now they call it the African burial ground. But it literally sat in the middle of a Lenape village, mm -hmm. right? So who do you think the oldest bodies they're pulling out of those burial grounds are? And which direction do you think they're being buried in? That's how they could tell the difference between the African right. and the um indigenous and the native. And the aborigines. Yeah, hey, something right. as simple as that. Simple. It, it's not like I, I don't want to get too off topic. I want to stick with the No, you know, you're doing fine. I want to stick with the top, but um, no, that's in the, that's that's still in the same ram. That's still in the same ram because it's just like down there in Florida. You know, when they say that if you can get down here to the Floridas, you know, we brought Africans with us and other Indian tribes with us down there to Florida to St. Augustine and the and and all these other places. You know, to Tampa and and to Pensacola and to all these other places, the Tallahassee. You know, and all, um, yeah. So they live with us. They live amongst mm -hmm. us. They had children with us. And you know, then, even in St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. You know, and, they, and that, there was a whole conglomerate of different nationalities marrying one another. You got mm -hmm. people that want to use the narrative of being the victim. That's what they want to hear. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But people wasn't getting raped all the time. They had people that was actually in love with one another and they had children. Mm-hmm. Like, see, like, you know, we could talk about so many things right now, like in terms of, like, I don't want to jump into another topic, but what you're talking about, Pop, makes me want to talk about reparations and what makes people think that in 2022, you deserve reparations for what your ancestors suffered in the 1700s. And what makes you think your ancestors weren't given land? Like, study your history, find out your history. You'll find out your families were wealthy at one point. We lost it all during the civil rights movement, right? That's when we had our own communities. Like, Black Wall Street in, in Oklahoma wasn't the only one. They were all over the place. But we lost these things during the civil rights movement when we wanted to integrate. Integration took right. these things away. Now you have generations of people who have grown up since the 60s and 70s with nothing. When I look back at my mother and her generation, my mother's father owned businesses, multiple businesses, was successful enough to have 15 kids. They wasn't asking for reparations. No, all that fell apart during integration and now we're looking here like we got nothing and we're going, oh, we need reparations. No. What we need, if anything, is relief from the oppression we faced. Right. But if you're talking about relief from slavery, why are you deserving of it? And your great grandparents weren't. Like anybody should have received it. It was them. And like I said, if you do, the, if like I know, I know this much. My my six time great grandfather, right, who was born a slave, was freed and given land. And from that point, he thrived to the point where he was so successful and his family, his offspring were so successful. We own thousands of acres of Jersey Shore land. Anybody that knows anything about real estate in the world. 
The Jersey Shore and New York City are some of the highest real estate. You know, the prices are that land is valuable. And this is land that my why you think is owned and owned. So I don't want to hear that. Why you think it's on monopoly? Why yeah. you think it's on monopoly? <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of times our people climbed out of those pits that we were in that we read about, right? But the generations now, the people now want to scream for these things that your ancestors who actually went through that just worked hard for and got out of. You understand? It it's not going to happen anyways. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> the government is only going to allow a certain amount of, of, of financial help to any tribe. Yeah. No, they make it very hard for you to become state or federally recognized. Now, this is the thing about that, right? This is the thing about that. People really think state rec or federal recognition is a blessing. It's not. Once you sign away your rights, you cannot get them back. You are no, all these, they say, oh, we're federally recognized. That means you get paid to keep your mouth shut, sit on that reservation, and keep the status quo. Let me, like, the whole situation with uh, Standing Rock, right? Where those people were saying, no, they're digging up our sacred ground so they can put this pipeline through. Right. The issue is 100 years ago when they made that treaty with the United States and the United States recognized them people, the United States was put in, put in a position of being power of attorney over those people's land. So y'all get to stay here, but we control the land. And being a power of attorney gives you the right to make decisions. And if there's a situation that says we can do something with this land that's going to benefit the people, Right. The power of attorney has the right to make that decision. So what happens is the United States being a power of attorney says if we bring this oil pipeline through here, it's a lot of money to be made. Y'all will make money. Corporations will make money. We doing it. But what's happening is the political aspect of that tribe has already signed off. The spiritual part of the tribe is saying, no, you can't do it. These are sacred lands. But guess what? The deal was already made. It was made generations ago. That's why they're recognized. So for them to sit up here and have the whole world thinking that the United States is violating them, y'all already signed off on that. Yep. Dotted line. If, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I thought that they actually not federally recognized anymore. The Lakota? Oh, no. They get money. Yeah. They the biggest recognized. Oh, this they still, they still federally recognized. They the biggest one. Oh yeah, they definitely are. They get bread. They get bread, and, uh. and I don't want to get into it. it's none of my business. I'm just, I'm just saying what's going on. And people think that this recognized thing means something. It only means that you are subject to the United States and their laws as a nation. jurisdiction, right. as a nation. Mm -hmm. Like we're subject to the United States as individual people. But my nation is not subject to the United States. And when my nation gets itself together, we're going to be on equal par with the United States historically because we were here before then. Like the Delaware right. have a right to create their own state. It's in the treaty. They just have not because the ones who are in control, the ones who are being recognized and are, are dealing with the government, got their land. You know what I mean? Even though it's on Cherokee territory. They don't even really have their own land. But we'll get into something else. We'll get into that later. But the point is, they're recognized. They get their benefits. They're cool. But guess what? You have the right to have your own state in the United States. That would be a Lenape state. Why aren't you? Well, because they share the land out there with the Cherokees. <laughs> and many of them are trying to take over. I don't want to know if I'm saying it, but take over. Jersey. Yeah, they're trying to come back. And they know it's people like me, the Ramapo, the Nancy Coke. You know what I mean? They know we're out here. So they've been trying to discredit people and trying to say we not this and we not that. But the point is, we got multiple native communities in Jersey. We've been active. When they left, we were still active. They trying to come back, we still active. They not gonna move us. 
on top of the fact they already signed a deal with the United States government. How you gonna renege on a deal you've been collecting money for for all this time? You gonna get the money back? They have a deal <laughs> that we located them in Oklahoma. They forfeited all their rights to the land here. You signed the deal. You can't now renege on the deal and say you're gonna come back here. That's not how it works. They'll never be able to come back in New Jersey. New Jersey won't. They're trying away. real hard to. New well, Jersey there's this thing away. called land back. There's a thing called land back where they're actually one, getting. One more, one more, more hon. Introduce yourself. Dousti, no da ne, si do ne la, da wo do, yo na, kan ke. It said, uh, hello, family. What's up, family? Actually, in Cherokee, my name is uh, Black Bear. Okay, now finish what you were saying. Um, there a lot of there's a program now called Land Back that they're trying to get land back in their historical territories now. Mm -hmm. That's around. And I was just gonna kind of uh piggyback off of what um uh oh, shoot uh Norris was saying because like I'm second generation from or third generation. My great grandfather was a sharecropper, he didn't get nothing down there in Mississippi, and because he didn't I have generation wealth. My grandmother didn't. My great, my dad didn't. And now I'm fighting to get like um, just a business going and stuff like that. Yeah, there's there's these different grants out there, but why should me as an indigenous person have to write for anything when we're already here? But then we let these people who come over from Haiti, Mexico, Africa, and they just giving. You well, see I can I mean? answer that. This is my theory. It's because they do business with those countries. And if there's a war also, they want allies. That's a, that has always been my theory. It's political. Why they put other countries ahead of us, you know, as far as stores and uh, grants and donations, they'll do for foreigners before they do for the people here. That's just my theory. You got to remember, they're all foreigners. Like mm -hmm. they're all foreigners. It's not like, but they don't view them as foreign. They they view them as countries that they could um, bring into a war if they have to bring into what a I'm, war. What I'm saying is, this is the only country on the planet where foreigners control the interests of that particular territory. What I'm saying is, the people that make decisions for what goes on in North America are not traditionally North Americans. If you go to China, the president of China is a Chinese man. Yeah. Mm. Heritage. You go to Russia, Russian. You go to the, all these African nations, the president of those particular nations is Africans. Africans from that nation. Mm. This place is the only place where we are being controlled by the interests of foreigners and all these foreign families that own United States all are still rooted back in their lands, in the countries they're from. They haven't severed their ties to where they don't have roots back there. They still have their roots. And they still can go back to those countries anytime they want. You know what I mean? Whether they're United States citizens or not, they have not lost the knowledge of who they are. And they make decisions that will benefit them, their people, and their allies. We are not. So that's why they give them well, well, the key word, the key word you just used was allies. Those that's what I'm saying. They're allies. Mm -hmm. You know, they need they need them. They control our country, but they still need their allies in case everything breaks out. Yeah. So for us well, indigenous people. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cheeto Paul. Um, I remember I had a friend of mine, he passed away in 2007. And we was talking. He was a BIA police, and I, I, I had no idea that the BIA had a police. You know what I'm saying? He was like, "Oh," he said, "Being federal recognized is not all cracked up to be." He said, "Oh, because when you become federal recognized, you have a reservation. Um, they get to put a BIA office on that reservation with the BIA police." And I'm like, "Huh?" He was like, yeah, he said, don't you know that they just can't cut a tree down? They got to ask for permission to cut a tree down on their own land. I was like, okay. No, nice. He said, yeah, they become GI. And I said, GI is a government entity. He said, you actually right, Bob. Mm -hmm. It's not what people think. Like, 
know, my particular tribe never, never, ever applied for federal recognition, recognition, and the state recognizes us because the state bought land from us to become the state, and it's in the history books. Right. So why should we ask? Right. Like, we predate the United States. Why should we be asking them for recognition when they're our children? Parents don't ask children for recognition. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Right. So, all right. Like, Would you say it's a mind frame? What do you mean? Um, that they feel they have to ask these people for recognition. No, it ain't my frame. It's the, we've been coming. Indoctrination of thought. Uh, well, I mean, it's easy to indoctrinate people when you physically dominate them. And it, listen, people think we're fighting a war. We lost the war. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, we're in a state of, I don't want to say captivity, because that's like being too dramatic. But we have acquiesced. We are living as United States citizens, even those of us who retain our culture and our heritage. The power that is, is the United States government. We don't have our own armies. We don't have none of these things to stand up to these people. So it's easy for them to start psychologically controlling us when they've already dominated us on a physical level. You know, you're going to acquiesce to exist. This is why our elders stop teaching us the things we taught that, that they know. This is why so many people don't know they got native in their ancestry, because our elders decided it was easier for us to be able to move forward under the auspice of being Negro or being colored, whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? That's just because of the sheer fact that they were making life so difficult for people who were proud. And if you weren't on a reservation, you couldn't be a proud Indian. Mm -hmm. I, I got something to interject about not being federally recognized. Okay, on my mom's side, she's Mexican indigenous, Yaqui, right? And so my great-grandmother, Josephine Estrada, was born before there was even a Yaqui reservation down there outside of Tuscan. It's called Pascual Yaqui, and then they got Guadalupe, and they got all these different little indigenous communities that they said have been there before the res, but since she didn't I guess she didn't sign up, then my grandfather couldn't be recognized, whatever. But they said my great-grandmother didn't want to go on the red. She didn't want to be under the government because she, and now, now I understand she didn't want to be controlled and things like that. And to be free out there in Arizona was everything because a lot of those reservations out there, they they have their casinos, but they're, it looks very pro impoverished. It looks like that money's not being spread around. Whoever got it, they just ain't using it right. Yep. If they know how to use it right, yep. maybe maybe using it on themselves. You know, they're mm -hmm. no different than politicians that we deal with in our communities, right? Because they've already and you know what and, mentality, and, and that's why, and that's why some of the Lakota and them went to the United States Congress mm -hmm. and was saying that it was being treated unfairly because the government officials of the Lakota Nation. And they was doing things, and that would actually cause them to become urban Indians at that time when they started moving in the urban areas. Wow, that's crazy. Oh, I wanted to ask you a question about what's this new generation of putting down Mardi Gras Indians and 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 saying that they're insulting uh, the Indians by dressing like that, and they really don't know the history of the connection of the Mardi Gras Indians and um, their um, honoring of indigenous people. Can you tell the uh, audience a little bit about that history? Okay, okay. Now, let me tell you, I also mask, okay, with uh, with the Mardi Gras Hunters. I'm the wild man for the Mardi Gras Hunters. And, um, but people in them don't understand is that they're not down here in the south, east, and southern Gulf Coast regions. That's first of all. Those nations that helped the African slaves were in the south, in the east, southeast, and the south Gulf regions. So it don't have nothing to do with the um, mid east. I mean, Middle Plains, Midwest. It don't have nothing to do with them. That's first of all. 
because mm. look where we are. We are right here in misnomer, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dealing in New Orleans, New Orleans is actually a Choctaw territory. Mm. Most people know it as Choctaw, but we mm. say Choctaw. Mm. All right. So when you have people that was taken from the Congo, when you have people that was taken from Algiers, when you have people that was taken from Mali, when you had people that was taken from Sierra Leone, when you had people that was taken from Ghana, when you had people was taken from the Canary Islands and all that there, and you had nations that was dealing with the um the Bambora and the um the Fulani and all these other nations and stuff, they was actually brought here to misnomer Louisiana because like we said the Mississippi was the route so when they dropped them off right here to New Orleans mm -hmm. because Jackson Square that they have used to actually be a slave square after they bring them over across in Algiers and they would break them and they bring them back and they sell them right there where uh, Andrew Jackson Square is okay so what happened is where Harris Casino is at right now, where I took Cousin Norris at the foot of Canal Street, which used to be Rivergate, that was a huge sugarcane plantation right there that went from Canal Street all the way back there to Chapatula Street. All right? That was a huge plantation. You had another plantation that was in the night ward right there where they had the industrial canal at. So the closest Indian village of the Chapa Tools was right there where it became known as Trimi. Okay? That's where you have Louis Armstrong Park at. So, when you have, you got to remember, back then at that time, New Orleans was still a swampland area. So, also at the same time, you had Choctaws, Chickasaws, Tunica, uh, Apecapa, all of them there was also slaves with the Africans. So when the Indians in them was like, look, we about to get up all chill. You heard me, y'all coming with us? If you're coming, come. So that's when they went. So when you had Indian slave raids going on on the plantation, there was slave masters writing to Governor Galvis saying, we don't know what to do with these Indians. They are taking our slaves and livestock and they're going into the swamps. So when it was to come, we'd tell them, look, we're going to put y'all in tribal regalia. Don't open your mouth for nothing. Because if you open up your mouth, you'll be exposed. Because now that's where the saying from that they say all black people look alike. Because if we have you in tribal regalia, they ain't going to know if there was an African or not. They're not going to know that. That was mm. the same way that happened in St. Augustine, Florida. That's also what happened in Tallahassee. That happened in Tampa and all those places. You see? And that's what they couldn't understand. So now what happened is that those Africans was giving tribute to those Shatans who was free and those Chickasaw and I mean um yeah, Chickasaws and, and Tunica and them that was in the Louisiana territory, that's who they were paying homage to. Because now, dealing with that, there's a plantation that's called the Whitney Plantation. When you had someone from an African nation marry someone from a tribal nation, that African and Indian child that was mixed, they became known as a griff. G-R-O-I-F. Okay, that was the name for them before they started saying mulatto and all that there. You see? So, when you see a carnival Indian, that's what you see. You see a cultural blend of both. Because you had Africans marrying Indians, and Indians marrying Africans, and having children. And that's what you see. So, when they're talking about, oh, they're making mockery, no, they're not, because they don't even much know who you are. You way up there in the northeastern plains somewhere. They don't in the in northwestern plain. They don't know who you are. Mm. 
And even and even the even the words that we sing in chant when we sing in Indian red, which we know who we are, you know, we say Kude Kude Fayo Indian Red Indian Red Right? Oh when we say um Ico Ico mean listen I can oh that's a Muscogee word that ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. You see? So when you see us chanting and singing and dancing, we doing reenactment and seeing another tribe, you seeing us coming together and paying homage. And that's what you see. It's not making no mockery of anybody. It's totally different. Because now Very you're seeing both the African and Indian blend. Absolutely. At this at this point in our experience. We are a blend of a multitude of people. We not, you know what I mean? Like we've been around for so long. Like if you look at your own families, you're gonna see a multi-ethnic reflection in your family. So why don't we think that would be uh, evident in nations, especially nations that have been interacting with other nations even before slavery? You know what I mean? There's a um right. I was telling somebody the other day, there is a I'm gonna look them up for you so I can speak to this verbatim. Um, there is a Delaware Lenape, right? His name is Jim Ned, right? If you uh, Google Jim Ned, you'll find that uh, he was located in, in Texas. Schools named after him. Uh, so Jim Ned. Let me, uh, I just want to, Jim Ned was a chief, right? So they have markers for him. Jim Ned, probably named for Jim Ned, Delaware Indian chief during Republic and early statehood of Texas, about 1840 to 1860. He was a scout for the Texas militia on several campaigns against wild Indians in this area. So um, Jim Ned was a Delaware Lenape, right? One of the ones that we moved out to Texas. Jim Ned was half African. He was a chief. He was one of the best leaders that they had, that the Delaware had. He's a legend. These Delaware that live out in Oklahoma they celebrate him. They talk about him. He is well known. But what they don't talk about is that Jim Ned is part African. Right? And this was in the 1800s. So this was something that was taking place. It's been going on for hundreds of years. And it's documented proof that not only were these uh mixed nationals i hate to say race we all the same race but these mixed uh ethnically mixed lenape were at the forefront of their tribe you know what i mean not just some little extra no he was the chief he was the leader and they said he walked around with all the vigor of an african now when they say vigor they talking about what we call swag charisma <laughs> in what made us special made you stand out you know what I mean? Some people got it, some people don't. Jim Ned had it, which is a part of the qualities that make you a good leader. You know what I mean? People being attracted to you, wanting to follow you. It's not something that you can force on people. It's a natural quality you're born with. You know what I mean? So anybody wants to Google the person, Jim Ned. Just put Jim Ned, Delaware Chief. It's going to come up. Um, if I could find it, let me, let me look for the description I have of him. Like a okay. big that'd be great. So yeah, it's ample proof that we have been uh, amalgamating and mixing in for hundreds of years, and it never was an issue. It never was an issue until this group now needs to say that their indigenous, autochthonous, aboriginals. And they're pure and they're the real Indian. Like 
our Indian ancestors didn't look the way we look. I'm sorry, it's, it's the truth. You know what I mean? Do we still resemble them on some levels? Yeah. Is our complexion still similar to that? Yeah. But our phenotypes have changed because of the people we've intermixed with. It's as simple as that, right? For anybody to run around and look in, they, look in the mirror and say, I'm what the original Indian looked at, and because of that, I'm going to discard everybody else. These people still got culture, still got their language, still got all these things that we're going to need to access to be able to learn our culture fully. You know what I mean? Some people, they still have the culture. And insulting people and doing all these things is not going to get us the culture back nor do we want to sit up here and create a whole new culture we already did that it's called hip-hop mm. right that's a culture we created in the past 50 years and now it's proliferated over the entire world and everybody's into hip-hop culture but that's not our ancient culture is aspects of our ancient culture visibly seen in hip-hop culture yeah absolutely we could do a whole show on that but you're welcome to come back <laughs> huh huh so you're always welcome to come back and, and teach but that. The, the point is, like, we're we're doing so much to try to, like, not we, I'm not going to include myself in that. There are individuals out here that are perceived to be at the forefront of this conversation, and they're doing nothing but speaking divisive. And they make people like Cheeto Pond, myself, who are authentic, who are really connected to our communities, we get lumped in with them and we have to straighten out the things they say and the insults that they make. You know what I mean? And that's not helping any of us move towards, you know, the future that we want for ourselves. You know what I mean? So to get back to what this conversation was initially about, it's about us raising the standards and setting the bar. You know what I mean? Removing all the pseudo uh conversations like okay 10 years ago we was doing the looks alike thing i get it 10 years ago why are we still doing it now why are we still got a picture of shannon sharp and a drawing of an indian like that's proof no we have to take it up another level people have to be more responsible with the information they're presenting so it can be credible you know what i mean I wish I can turn the camera the other direction, um, but I can't. But I'm going to read this, right? And it's from the Whitney Plantation webpage. Um, it's called Whitney, W-I, I mean, W-H-I-T-N-E-W. And it go, I mean, why? To um, the slavery in Louisiana. It says, in 1712, there was only 10 Africans in all of Louisiana. In this mm -hmm. early period, European indentured service submitted to 36 months contract did most of the work in cleaning land and laboring in small scale plantations. They say this would change dramatically after the first two ships carrying captive Africans arrived in Louisiana in 1719. These slave ships were originally of the west coast of Africa carrying captive um rice farmers who bought the agriculture uh expressed the growth of louisiana rice plantation into profitable business and for their european owners they say in addition to instead africans and european indigenous service see people don't want to talk about the european indigenous service because they still had masses too right they said that earlier louisiana plantation owned Say in 1722, nearly 170 indigenous people were enslaved in Louisiana plantation. Listen what it says now. Now, what people don't fail to realize is that in Louisiana, in the Carolinas, in Virginia, these nations had different type of form of slavery. Okay? Oh, um, with within Louisiana, the slaves can marry. In Carolinas, the slaves couldn't marry. Right? 
the only time when they can get married if they go down there to Florida. When they escaped, it became a whole new um, community. In the British colonies dealing with slaves, they couldn't get married. But in the South, they could get married because it was under the Roman Catholic Church. But anyway, let me finish going on to say that the marriages was relatively common between Africans and Native Americans. You see what it say? Marriages between Africans and Native Americans. And the children was called griffs. G-R-I-F was the racial designation used for their children. The African enslaved in Louisiana came most from Gambia and from Benin and Berapa of the West Africa. A few of them came from Southeast Africa. So you had Africans marrying indigenous people down here in Louisiana. Well, uh, another thing I wanted to discuss with you, uh, two of you wanted to discuss about migration and Hindu cultures. Well, um, and this is, well, let me just uh, read this excerpt about Jim Ned first, because uh, okay. what we're trying to do here now is, is normalize the conversation, like take away the sensationalism. And what's happening now is this conversation is being bombarded with sensationalism. When I say that, I mean the transatlantic slave trade never happened. Okay? Migrations never happened. Uh, we have no African in us. Like these are all extreme things, right? That are making, that are turning this conversation pseudo, right? So I want to show, and what Cheeto Pa is doing now is showing that there is irrefutable evidence that we have been intermixing with people of all nationalities, right? So for someone to sit up here and say, look at me, I'm the real such and such, you're negating actual history, you know what I mean? And you're painting a picture that is not healthy for people who are now coming behind you and trying to learn things. So let me just read this about Jim Ned. It starts off with Black Beaver, who was a another Delaware chief that Jim Ned was under. So it says, Black Beaver of the absentee Delaware had long represented his people with the whites. The army and the now su successionist OIA agent in the least district, Matthew Leeper. On April 16th, he was warned the soldiers that the, te that the Texans would invade the territory which had been claimed by Texas before it joined the Union. All right, so it says, Stuck Tum Mekwa personally escorted the soldiers back to Fort Leavenworth, leaving leadership of the Delaware in the hands of 45-year-old Jim Ned, a remarkable specimen of humanity who, who wore a turban on his head shade, impressed observers estimated his African blood to be from a slight admixture to half nothing that he displayed. All the social vivacity and gorility of the Negro in his mannerisms, an undisputedly courageous leader, he persuaded many Indians around the Wichita agency to abandon the lesser, the least district while leper con confiscated the property of, chief, of chiefs. So basically it's just saying that this man, Jim Ned, was encouraging Indians to not cooperate with what was going on and wanted them to separate themselves from the European. Black Beaver, who was one of the wealthiest Lenape ever, and he got rich from trading uh, trading goods with the Europeans, he cornered the market on that. And that's how he got rich, basically selling out the culture. You understand? And he had a problem with Jim Ned because Jim Ned was a real man of the people. And Black Beaver even attempted to have Jim Ned killed at one time. So it's a lot of stuff. So the animosities and things that's going on, like these are things that have been going on forever, for a long time in our communities, in, in these indigenous communities, in these nations. There have been people of African ancestry within these tribes that had major positions, right? So for all these people to sit up here and keep insisting that the Af that the slave trade wasn't real that they're all we're all the 
hundred percent. I'm the full blooded this and that. It's nonsense, and they don't know history. And hopefully, when people, anybody who sees this, anybody who moves forward, when they hear these people talk this craziness, they're gonna know to stay away from. Them. And there's a lot of other signs we gonna hopefully we can point out tonight. Can y'all can y'all see this right there? Can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Um, I see it, but I can't read it. I can't. Maybe Norris can. No. Nah. Can y'all see that? Y'all see it now? You have to read it though. Okay. Dealing. With, and this is on the Whitney Plantation web page when they have the countries and the voyage and the slaves and it's all uh, transported and the percentage of slave transportation, right? All uh, country. Portugal, including Brazil, the voyage thirty thousand. It says Spain on uh, Spain, including Cuba, four thousand. France, including the West Indies, four thousand and two hundred. Holland, two thousand. Britain, twelve thousand. The British North America, U.S., one thousand and five hundred. Denmark, two hundred and fifty. Others, two hundred and fifty total. 54,200, okay? That's that part. And then, uh, let me go to this other part right here. Now, they say region and numbers of slaves. They say Brazil, 4 million. Spanish Empire, 2,500,000. British West Indies, two million, right? On um, the French West Indies, one million six hundred thousand. British North America, United States, five hundred thousand. Dutch West Indies, five hundred thousand. The Danish West Indies, twenty eight thousand. Europe Islands, two hundred thousand. A total came up to. 11,328,000 numbers of slaves. And that's from the Whitney Plantation that's down here in Miss Norma, Louisiana. Wow. Wow. So people don't have to understand that when you're talking about ships, they can't overload no ships because if you overload a ship, the ship is going to sink. Mm -hmm. um, Norris, do you believe there were slave ships or something else? All right, so this is like, this is such a, this is how people play with you. This is how they play. They'll say, where are the slave ships? How come ain't no museums? Where are the slave ships? There were no such thing as slave ships, they were called cargo ships. Right. Just like you'll have a boat that's shipping uh, cars from China, when that boat goes back, it'll have something else on it, right? So looking for a slave ship, like what model? Oh, that's the uh, T-15 uh, new slave ship model, it's faster. No, that's that's ridiculous. These were cargo ships that they did trade with. So if you're looking for a slave ship, look for the same ship that had potatoes on it. And guess what? Those ships are all over. In, in, in Norway, they have a whole museum of boats that were used for Atlantic, for, the, for trade across the Atlantic. I'm sure some of those ships had slaves on them. Like, this is the stuff that people do to sound intelligent. Oh, where are the slave ships? It's ridiculous. It's like saying, oh, like I just took a, I just, I, I took a lift today, right? There's no such thing as a lift car, <laughs> right? People just use their regular cars. So now if in a hundred years, somebody said, oh, lift, that didn't exist. Where are all the lift cars? I can show you the yellow cabs and they can take you to a old, uh, 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 dump with a million yellow cabs. And they'll go, see, yellow cabs existed. Where are the lift cars? How come there's no cars with lift painted on it? They're looking for the, but no, it don't work that way. These yeah. ships that they transported slaves in were regular ships. They didn't have a big sign on the side, TWA or 
S L A V E. None of that. They were just ships. So to, to use that as an assertion that the slave trade didn't exist shows to me that people don't have what we would call like, like they're not comprehending the information and they're looking for a way out of it. And as soon as they see a small crack that sounds intelligent, they use it. But truthfully, it's not intelligent because anybody who's going to have a responsible conversation is going to say what I said. Ain't no such thing as slave ships. They're cargo ships, and they're all over. Right. Now, check this out, right? Check this out. Right here, this is also from the Whitney Plantation. They have the name and practices against uh, amongst the Fulani of San Gambia, of uh, Louisiana, Vegas, right? And they say order of birth. They say the male name of Louisiana. Uh, they have the names that they have for them, um, the name of the practice, where they was born, their date, and everything, where they were from, uh, dealing with the tribes and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the Whitney Plantation have, they kept documents. They yeah. kept they kept documents. They actually kept documents and good documents and catalogs. And um, one of the people Oh, family that was of the Whitney Plantation that was slaves, they called the Heidel family. And the Heidel family had one of their family members to be the mayor of New Orleans. His name was Dutch Moriel. Okay. And also another family member of theirs uh, was Leah Chase. Leah Chase she was the one who married Dookie Chase, but she was a high Um, uh, and they became known as Creoles, okay, which were um uh, Indians and Africans and French and Spanish mixed, you know. So yes, they they kept good records. Absolutely kept records. I, I have the I have records too as well, and they're so extensive, as Pa said, they'll tell you where they took them from and where they dropped them off. Like, I don't know what people are talking about. There's no records. There's tons of records. Like, what are these people doing? Like, and at this point, Google is so easily accessible. You don't even have to type. You could ask Siri and Siri will bring you the information. What is the matter with people that they would sit up here and try and tell us these things didn't exist? And then to prove it, they'll just say, it's a lie. Right. It's a lie does not prove anything. You're just saying it's a lie. And then they'll then they'll use circular uh, uh, conversations, right, where they don't give you the evidence. They just talk around it. They just talk around it. And they try to appeal to what we believe is common sense. Like one of those questions is like trying to appeal to your common sense is where are the slave ships? Well, Guess what? Slavery was illegal at that time. So during the voyages, they wouldn't be having no hanging no flags. They wouldn't be advertising what they doing. You know what I'm saying? Um, so people are asking or they're, they're looking for things to disprove actual events. And they're trying to use what they call common sense. But common sense ain't common no more. In fact, it's nonsense. <laughs> nonsense. Exactly. Yeah. And look right here, now, family. Look, okay. I have another one from the Whitney Plantation. The 18th most frequent African ethnicities in Louisiana from 1719 and 1820. Gender and female, the ethnicity will be Bambora or, or Mandinka, Nora or Moore, as you can see right there, right? Moore, right? They say from Bambora. They say 413 males and 53 females. As you can see, it wasn't that many African females. It wasn't that many African females. All right. I'll break that. It down. was more males. It was more males than African females, but I'm gonna touch on something after this, right? They have the Mandinka. Okay. Now. I want to touch on this part about the Mandinka because everybody want to talk about roots, right? But if anybody paid attention, 
They said Kuta Kinte wasn't a real person and that Alex Haley actually um, plagiarized the book of uh, Africa that this white boy had supposed to did, right? But yet, what was Kuta Kinte ethnicity or nationality? He said that he was a Mandinka warrior exactly. of the Ashanti, right? But look, there was 617 males that was born here to, to Louisiana and only 305, okay? Dealing with the Moors, there was 101 males and 35 females. Dealing with the uh, Fulani, right? You only had 160 males and 50 females. Dealing with Senegal, or the Wolof, right? 363 males, 234 females. Dealing with the Kizzy, which is the K-I-S-I, was 51 males and 35 females. Now, what was Kuta Kinte's daughter name? Her name was Kizzy, right? Kinzy, yeah. Her name was Kizzy, right? The Kizzy's yeah. in them is from Angola, okay? Then you have the uh, Ken, uh, Kanga, which had 210 males and 129 females, all right? Now, they had the Yoruba and all of them there. Look, you even had the Igbo, and you know the e the Igbo say there was Hebrews, right? You got Igbo right there, right? So, dealing with that, you had people from the Congo. So, you had more males you have more males that was enslaved than females. So now you have to ask yourself this. Who there was pairing those many African males with because it couldn't have been the African females because that wasn't that many. You had Native American women that they was see, they don't want to talk about the sex plantations where they was taking the African men and breed them with the American Indian women. They don't want to talk about that. Because the American women were more fertile than the African women. But y'all can go ahead. <laughs> I want to know if the audience has any questions to ask you at this point. Okay, so I got a question from someone. I'm not sure he's on here, but I got a question from somebody on my own, on my uh, YouTube. Uh, think this would be for you Cheeto um and you probably have already addressed some of the things he's asking his name is Chris Ward not rock I slap back anyone on the panel that can speak on the southern United States Louisiana Mississippi Arkansas Alabama Georgia and Florida were once all known as West Florida if you go back and you look at the maps of the 1600s Florida was actually from what you see as Florida as the day and it went all the way up to upstate New York and then it went all the way to the state of Washington and it came on the side of California. That was in the 1600s. You remember the Spanish and them actually touched ground first in the south and then after that the Brit um the Portuguese well the Portuguese didn't come here but the um uh, the Spaniards, the Dutch, the British, and the English, you know, um, uh, well, the Dutch and the British and them came, you know, and then they also had the Germans here as well. The Germans was here in Louisiana. But um, yeah, what do you want to know about those those states? Uh, just in general, just some general information. I would say to him, um, definitely uh follow Cheeto Pod as his territory. You know, he's somebody who I've built with for a long time he knows a lot of information about what's going on in those areas so somebody you might want to follow him on, on his facebook uh, Cheeto yeah all, all, yeah all that was called the floridas all that was called the floridas at that time but see now in the 1600s it was called the floridas in the 1700s it was called the carolinas you know how far the carolinas had stretched in the 1700s the Carolinas in them stretched all the way over here to the Mississippi River and the Caribbean islands and all that. Well, that was also called the Carolinas as well in the 1700s. And this was before the British and them even came to start the United States. All 
All right, so um, you still there? Pa? Okay, I thought you might have been frozen. Shit, you had that smile. Yeah, I'm still here. Face. I, I yeah. ain't the screen froze on you. You was getting it in like that. Right. Yeah, it was called the Carolinas because okay. remember the Carolinas and then wound up splitting, and that's when it became known as North Carolina and South Carolina, and then Georgia annexed out of South Carolina, Alabama annexed out of Georgia, Mississippi annexed out of Alabama, and <laughs> and then you had Louisiana, but Mississippi and Louisiana was still called even to this day West Florida. Yeah. Um, is there a link for anybody that is trying to uh, that's watching that could possibly, if they want to call in, can we make that link available to people? Someone says Anthony Heron, how to find a ship manifest? They treated the people like cargo and property, so the wise thing to do look for ship manifests. What we were speaking of, those are the ship manifests. Um, what is it? Slavery.org, is that it? The site that has yeah. a lot of records. You can go right on there yeah. and it's going to give you all the records. You just got to know the, uh, you got to be able to access the information comprehensively and, and know what you're looking even, for. Even the new museum that they have, the, uh, the African Museum. They mm -hmm. have the slave manifest and stuff there, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Yeah, like this, like people say, all this information is hidden. It's not hidden. We just ain't been looking for it. We've been looking for King Tut. You know what I mean? We've been looking for, you know, all these other things that aren't relevant to our. Did you mention something about Africa being here, or someone saying Africa? Uh, a hidden piece of Africa. Well, what they're what they're talking about is like, okay, so in New Jersey, right, right in New Jersey, I can speak of it. There is rock deposits that are identical to the rock deposits found in Morocco, mm -hmm. and at one point during these uh, tectonic plate shifts, as the ocean expands. Right, plate shift, pieces break off, they drift. So you're gonna have land from one side that's connected to land on the other side. You're gonna have pieces that have shifted and all that. All that, and this is another thing people do, they will use that to insinuate that this is that Africa was here or that mankind came here. You understand? Like, like geog geography or was it geology is one study right studying the earth and the history of the earth is one thing anthropology and studying the history of man is another is another people, thing people will take uh uh geological records and try to use that to somehow influence anthropo anthropological records so all this is one planet and truthfully if you take all the water off it's all connected we just yeah. have the impression that it's separate bodies of land because of these giant vast oceans and seas but if you look at mars if you look at the moon you'll see it's one body but because we're so small and the oceans are so big we're not realizing that's a huge chasm huge you know what I mean? We living on plateaus that are above water level. And when the water levels change, the land masses appear to change because more water gets exposed, more land gets exposed, or more land gets hidden. Right? right. So all these things that people are talking about are geological things. And if we're going right. to talk about that, let's have a, that conversation and not use that to infer other things. Because the right. only reason people are studying these things is because they're trying to, like, this is the big secret. Shh, don't tell nobody. People right. want to make it as easy as possible to prove that they are indigenous or aboriginal. or So if they can remove the slave trade, then they don't have to speak to that. Right? If they can say this is Africa, mm -hmm. 
and this is where we all really came from, that means they can keep the history that they've been molding themselves around, thinking they form a certain culture, right? And they can keep that here. This is why people will tell you Egypt was here. The Mississippi is the Nile. They'll tell you all these things because they don't want to give up what they've been indoctrinated because that's where they find their strength and their power. So they want to move things around and they want to do all these things when really, no, a lot of the things you probably learned, it's not that it ain't true. It just didn't apply to you. So you and then you to know what, too? Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. So you just have to sometimes put things down that serve. They may have served you for a period of time, but moving forward, they might not necessarily serve you. So right. we have these conversations about are there bodies of land here that were connected to Africa at one time? Absolutely. But those are yeah. geological. In Alabama, there's a piece that's yeah. still connected. Yes, but those are geological conversations, and they right. don't speak Even to the to the anthropology or the politics of nations. Right, like, exactly. Like no, no president of African nation is saying to the president of the United States, you know, shoot, there's a part of Africa underneath America, attached to America. So we got jurisdiction. You know what I mean? Like what, what are we talking about? Like these are, these are straw man conversations that people come up with. Right. And, you know, it, it's like, yeah, it there's, part, there's parts of Africa connected to mainland America. It's parts because it's all one body at the end of the day. Mixing science with history. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, and but you know what's so funny? The science you know, they're speaking on. Like I but, had but a brother the so other day to uh -huh. prove to me that we're all that African Americans aren't from Africa. He had an African doctor. She had a video saying African Americans aren't from Africa. Of course, African Americans aren't from Africa. First of all, people who have been labeled African American, it's happened since the 60s. So why would somebody who's in the 60s, see what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's nonsense. But even on top of that, he thinks because this woman is an African, and because she's a doctor, she's qualified to speak on anthropology. And she's not. So, yeah, like, what type but of you, doctor is she? But you know what's you know, so funny, though? You know what's so funny? I'm going to take it out of the slave trade. That was recently. Let's talk about before mm -hmm. the slave trade even yeah. happened. People don't want to talk about that. No. Um, but then my family, we have a story, old story saying that we used to travel in canoes, mm -hmm. okay, to go and trade across the Atlantic. Do you know that we had a canoe that was actually 50 yards and 100 yards long? Mm -hmm. Wow. See, they ain't gonna put that in books. But there is one indigenous brother, and I think he's a Lenape, if I'm not mistaken, um, who wrote the book. About. Yeah, he wrote the book about how American Indians went to Europe. The native discovery of Europe. I'm looking yep. so, look, so look, look, if uh, you have no other nations that can go to Europe, certain yeah. nations just can go strictly right we, there we to Africa. Say, right there. We're on the same frequency. I was looking it up right now. Look, look. See, that's what family do. <laughs> that's what family do. And see, and that's what, and, that, and look, and not only did we trade with services and goods, but with trading, you know, you be there for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. You bound to, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? So you have mixing going on already before there was even much Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's deep. So there's a... There's so a not only you had people mixing before at the slave trade, but you had people mixing before the slave trade. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years before that. That's what I say about the Trail of Tears. Things were going on before and after that. You know, 
people want to make that a center of uh, Trail of Tears was everything, you know? We had life before and after. Right. And people end up asking the question, well, how did the Egyptians in them get uh, get coconina in their mummies? Well, the priesthood of uh, the Toltecs and the Mayans in them, they traveled all the way to Egypt. Yeah, there's, there's actually a temple in Egypt that is actually a Mayan temple that has Mayan writing on it. And the story is told that a Mayan was living amongst the Egyptians. And that's where you get the concept of when in Rome, do as the Romans. Do as Rome do. So he was yeah. in Egypt and he lived as an Egyptian man, but he was a Mayan. And inside of his home, they have discovered what is Mayan writings, all these type of things. In the calendar. So, in the calendar. Like, and this is a, you know, I, I got the video. I put the video out years ago. You know what I mean? Right. So, man, there was absolute trade between nations. There are, there's a Lakota chief. And, you know, I've given this book out to many people. Um, there's a Lakota chief that writes in his book, and he talks about the uh, four treaties, right? Different treaties with different groups, right? Like the like Noah's Ark was a treaty, right? You have the uh, Cleopatra Treaty. They were treaties with different nations, which allowed them Camel to... Treaty. Huh? Yeah, the Camel Eye. You know what I'm talking about. Camel Eye Treaty. These were these are ancient treaties that allow different nations to come to the Americas, right? And this is b way before uh, the transatlantic, the 1400s. These are ancient treaties. This these treaties are a part of why Native Americans went to Europe to help uh, free them from the grip of Rome. Like the same way the United States will send delegates to other countries to teach them how to wage war, Native Americans went to Europe and taught the tribes how to wage war. And they helped drive uh, the Romans out of their territory. This is what the King Arthur story and all that is about. It's referencing right. when that particular land was being colonized by Rome. And King Arthur right. was what? He was half Roman, half indigenous to that land. And they used him against his people. And when he woke up and realized what was going on, he fought against them. Like, that's the whole story of, you know what I mean, what King Arthur and all that is really about. Because though that's a, re that's a story reflecting indigenous people of Europe. And what they went through being colonized as far back as, what, what was that, 400 A.D.? Know what I mean? Like, like, this is before a lot of that is what left Europe open for the Visigoths to invade. And then after the Visigoths invaded, who went into Europe to straighten everything out? The Moors. And they established and look, everything. And then when they fell, 1492, and that's when the Europeans came here. Why did the Europeans come in 1492? Why not before that? Because when they inherited the land in Spain, they inherited the rights to the treaty. And I have all this in one of my documentaries that I put out years ago. They inherited the, the, the right to the treat the treaty rights that Spain had with North America. So now and then you know what's so funny, Norris? Mm -hmm. You know how long it had to be since they had the Camel Eye Treaty because they didn't have no camp. Camels in America in a long time. Well, that's just that's what how called. long that treaty is. That's just what it's called now. Like, yeah, it would have been called whatever in the particular languages that it was being drawn up at the time. You know what I'm saying? Right. But the the point is, and this is all documented. They have documentation. Like I said, I have a whole documentary that talks about it. But they have documentation in the uh, in uh, one of these museums in England, and it shows the actual uh manifest it shows on a certain date when uh what was the last castle in uh spain that 
1492, they, they uh, Granada. When Granada about Cordova? No, Granada. Granada and Cordova, yeah. Yeah, when Granada fell and they signed over the rights to it, it's in the manifest. And three weeks later in that same manifest is when they um, commissioned Columbus to come to the Americas. And it's all documented on, on record. Like, so these histories are all connected. They all play a part. You know what I mean? Uh, everybody discussing whether or not they knew about certain, certain Europeans didn't know about America. But of course, that the people who navigated the intellectuals knew there was land over here. Like, the commoners might not have, but why would a commoner who's just trying to live his life be worried okay. about some land on the other side of the sea? You know what I mean? Like, that's what we do now because we got nothing else to do with our life. So, but if people had to be out there really doing things to survive, had to be hunting and gathering and defending their lives on a daily basis, they wouldn't be concerned about all this stuff. You know right. what I'm saying? So, of course, people back then might not have known the vast range of information that common people know now, but these things were known. You just got to read you know, the it's, it's funny. You should mention this Jack Forbes, that's who he was. Jack Forbes, he wrote that book. They have any more questions? It's, it's, but, yeah, it's, I think, it's, uh, it's, okay, then. Anybody on your channel, um, Norris, got a question? Let me go low. It, it's funny that you um, mentioned um, the new something. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's the book there, Pop. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can hear yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, I was saying it's funny you mentioned those um, ancient treaties of e Egypt and things. Thomas Jefferson knew something because he traveled all through Long Island looking for. Hello? Mm -hmm, we hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Oh, you hear me? Yes. It's funny, you mentioned um, the ancient um, went all all through um, Long Island looking for a lost tribe of um, Egypt. Well, I understand. Just like Spain inherited treaty rights and they inherited knowledge. From the indigenous communities that were occupying the land that Spain came to occupy. Thomas Jefferson and all those them are descendants of Europeans who inherited the knowledge of Egypt. That's why Europeans are so influenced by Kemet. That's who raised them up. So they would be chasing after everything that was Kemet, everything that was right. Greek, because Greek was, was raised up from Kemet. He he wanted to um document all of the Long Island natives um language, but he also was looking for a lost tribe of Egypt. And that's how um Chief Pharaoh's family of uh, the Montauks, mm -hmm. that's how they got the name um Pharaoh. Yeah, he called him, yep. Yep. But you know what's so funny with all this being said it does. The East Coast and the South tribes, Southern tribes, were the ones that had first contact with the Morisco Empire. And the reason why I call it Morisco Empire because that was the Christian Moorish Empire, okay? Mm -hmm. That was dealing with Spain, Spain, 
France, Portugal, um, Germany, Austria, France, England, and all of that, right? But our brothers and sisters of the Med Plane, they didn't get to see the pale face until after the 1800s. From the 1500s to the 1800s, we was the ones that was actually feeling the blunt and the blow of the Morisco Empire and fighting them people and keeping them from going inland. But once again, Thomas Jefferson with the Lewis and Clark expedition, which wasn't really an expedition, it was a military expedition, right? Or exploration, I should say, when they went across the Mississippi. Because remember, King George told them that they could not go west of the Mississippi. They had to wait till he died to go west. Yes. That's when they started seeing the pale face. And the, they didn't get none of that until everything subsided with the wars that we had in 1812 deal with the, um, the French and Indian War and the Red Stick War. That would, every, that would broke everything down and then that's when it went west. First and that, they wasn't going west be before that. So we saw everything that was going on. All the records that they spoke of when they said they saw black Indians, right? They were <laughs> talking yeah. about the folks in them there. You know? They didn't much make it to the Midwest yet. You no. know what I'm saying? Everything that they saw was dealing with us. And I find it very funny and ironic that all the slave states happened with slavery where all the black Indian tribes were. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were the first people to be enslaved. The reason they even went and got Africans is because they couldn't enslave us no longer. You know what I mean? Right. That's, that's, his, that's historically documented. Like, Right. right. And for them to say that we was weak, that would be a lie because if you know what we did to build the mounds, you that's not a, 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 a bag of rice and a bag of cotton and a bag of tobacco and a bag of sugar cane cannot amount to the dirt, rocks, and soil that we had to use to build mounds. Yes, so, we are the mound builders. So I'm gonna read something real quick, just like it's it's. You know, this is coming out. You know, I got the computer in me, in front of me. It's just just googling little terms, right? So I googled uh, Lenape slavery in New Jersey. Many of New Jersey Lenny Lenape were enslaved by Dutch, Swedish, and English settlers. But more damaging to tribal life than slavery were the tactics used by white traders to gain control of Indian lands. Lenape viewed the earth in much the way we do the air, something used by everyone by own, but owned by no one. Now, many of New Jersey Lenape were enslaved by the Dutch, Swedish, and English. Okay, now. How do I know this without even reading this? My seventh time great grandfather was enslaved at Fleming Indian Plantation, which is now Flemington, New Jersey. This is documented history, right? They're telling you in their records and we're telling you from our family records. And then on top of that, we got the historians, right? People who love history and and go into history every state has historical society has all these people who love to look into the history another thing you have first families first european families right these families were the settlers those families did not forget their history in fact they right. love their history and they have whole organizations and clubs created around maintaining that legacy because they feel like they are the first Americans. Mm -hmm. So the person my seven-time great-grandfather was enslaved to was one of those people. He was born in Ireland and was the first of his family to move to um, the, new, to the New World, to New Jersey. He bought 100 acres right in the Raritan Valley and he built the first home 
in this area. It's now called the Fleming Mansion or something, but it's it's a historical place. You can go there and visit. I plan on going there. And my ancestors were enslaved on that plantation. On top of that, you know, another thing, my grandfather, my seven-time great-grandfather was there. My seven-time great-grandmother was imported there from Barbados. So when we talk about natives being taken to Barbados and brought back, these are all these stories. Like there are actually people who are descendants of these people that have these stories to share if they choose to, right? Now, one thing I, I wanna say about this information, which will lead me into the migration conversation when we're ready to get to that. A lot of people start by Googling and looking for information, but they have no foundation to weigh and judge it on, right? Because they don't have, they might not have been blessed with their family's oral histories. Their families might not have been in a position to record their histories, right? Many reasons, none of which we're not going to blame anybody. But there are those of us who have these things, right? And can show and prove for the things we talk about and aren't going to leave you out here like, well, maybe, well, maybe, well, maybe. No, we're going to tell you exactly what happened based on the records. And if you don't believe us, now you can go access the Internet and you're going to find the same records there. You know what I'm saying? So... It's not that we're just taking what we get out of off the internet or out of books. We're using these books and, and this uh, available information to almost verify what it is the ancestors told us, the elders told us. And I'll tell you, just being honest, some of the things that my ancestors told me that when I looked it up, it was kind of, it wasn't, you know what I mean? They had a few things, they weren't right about everything. And that's just the truth. You know what I'm saying? Like at this point, I know more than what any of my elders would have told me. Why? Because I live in a generation where I can access so much information that they couldn't. So it's things they knew that I can expound on now. See what I'm saying? Because of the technology we have. But it ain't, I don't know these things primarily because of the technology. That just enhances what has been handed down. Right. Just like with my ancestors, you know, and what people don't have to understand, because you see on your genealogy that somebody was a slave, that don't mean that they was an African. It could have been an Indian that was slaves. You know what I'm saying? Or it could have been both, you see? And it's really amazing because when you start doing GI, you be like, hold on, you find them on the census there in South Carolina, the next thing you know, they're in Louisiana, and then when you look again, they're in Mississippi, and it's like, well, what the hell? How that happened? Because you know, they were doing that, you know? But just like Cousin Norris said, you know, when you in the information age, you already have the handed down from the 70s and the 80s. Because once again, you didn't have no internet. But now since they have the internet and things that uh, what happened with Google and other places, they're going to these universities and stuff in these um, societies and they actually scanning these documents before they dissipate, you know. They're like, look, you can go find it here, find it here, find it there. You know what I'm saying? Um, I have family members that was able to speak Spanish and French. They were Indians. They spoke the tribal language as well. You know what I'm saying? So it's like Cousin Norris was speaking about um, dealing with the um, Lenape being the slave. We have the history right here dealing with the Yamasi War that is the native slave trade of coming conference, right? They say few American Indian wars were more devastating to colonists than more if, uh, influential than the development of the South in the Yamasi War of 1715. They say few American Indian wars was more devastating to the colonists and more influential in the Department of uh, Development of South Carolina in the Yamasi War in 1750 on April the 15th, which was yesterday, uh, was marked the 300th anniversary, which was two years ago uh, when this was done, because this was done in 2018. Two years ago. Uh, it says that there was a conference uh, being recognized of the war. It will be in St. Augusta 
Florida. All right, St. Augustine, Florida, with mere steps of the Yamasi archaeology sites. They say that the Yamasi people have been overlooked of mainstream and only one book has a written about the war. Denise Boise, who is also an associate professor of the history at the University of North Florida, um, who also is a co-organizer of the conference entitled the Yamasi Indians from Florida to South Carolina. It says that it was important event in Southern and North American history, yet it is one of the most least well-known wars compared to of the importance, she said. Most people don't know about the war. They don't know. Uh, they say in the late 1600s and the early 1700s, there was a time of a great disruption and loss of land as colonizers forced the tribe to be moved in Chester of um, the Pratt who is the archaeologist and co-organizer of the conference, explained that the time the Yamasi made their way to Charlestown of uh, South Carolina, now Charleston, the Spanish had already been uh, memorizing the tribe of Florida a hundred years ago. Because what wind up happening is, let me show you what wind up happening. We didn't know that the Spanish, the French, the Dutch and the British was all a part of the Holy Roman Empire. We didn't know that. None of the tribes didn't know that. Right? So the Spanish and them became our friends. We started doing trade with the Spanish. Then they got comfortable and wanted to enslave us. So we fought them and we beat them behind. Then we wind up being friends with the British, doing trade with the British. Then they say that we owe them skins and everything for dead beaver, and they're trying to tax us because the king taxed them. So they was like, well, since you all can't give us what we asked for, which we already did, we got to take your women, children, and men into slavery. And we say, oh, really? That's what you want to do? And next thing you know, the chiefs in them say, look, it's time to go to war. Were we supposed to went for a meeting with the proprietors of England? We didn't go for no meeting. They was in church. It's the weekend. Like the day. We hear the why they was in the church. But see, they didn't want to talk about that. We've been fighting the Holy Roman Morisco Empire since 1520s. So we fought them in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. So when you got people talking about 400 years of being oppressed, we had 400 years of fighting. Through all that, you never heard no one else speak about, you heard about the Amasi War, which they now begin to hear about it, but you heard of our other wars instead of the Yamasi War. They heard of the Gullah War, which was the Yamasi War. They heard of the First Seminole War, which is the Yamasi War. The Second Seminole War, which is the Yamasi War. And the Third Seminole War, which is the Yamasi War. Because it was like, we can't let the name Yamasi be out. That's, that's a no-no. We got to speak on that tribal name. So what they did, they started calling us the Creeks. They started calling us the Simmons. So yes, we've been fighting. Yes, there was in the mixing. Yes, both African, Spanish, French, Dutch, British, all that there. It's like Cousin Norris said, you have family members that look like they're white, but their blood is of the nation. Yep. They look like they're Africans, but their blood is of the nation. Like you say, many phenotypes. Absolutely. So, um, I don't know, Pop, I want to, um, can we, can we change up a little bit and just talk about uh, let's, let's talk about migrations. All right, let's go ahead. 
This is something. All right, so as I stated before, um, so a lot of the information that people lean on, right? I mean, if if, if, if you understand it and like you would consider yourself a good researcher, somebody who's able that can put pieces of the puzzle together, right? You'll know that in order to access certain histories, like all this history isn't going to be in one book, right? You're going to have to study different fields. You know what I mean? Somebody brought up, you know, yeah, geology, uh, anthropology, history, uh, genetics. In order to get a total understanding of what has happened in the world, you have to kind of be open to following what the information states. So I'll give you an example of what I say. So my nation, the Lenape Nation, has a migration myth. And basically the story, or should I say migration story, creation myth and a migration story, right? So basically the Lenape migration picks up from what they would say would be Siberia, uh, Bering Strait area, Alaska, right? And they'll say that the tribe migrated from that area into the Americas and migrated. We got to the Mississippi. There is where we encountered a group who would have been the Cherokee who occupied the territory. We asked them if we could cross it. Like it, it's a whole story. Ended up getting to a fight with them, a war with them, crossed over, kept going, got to New Jersey, what we call New Jersey and established our homeland. As the, as the nation grew, people would, uh, migrate north and south as far south as the tidewater area and as far north as canada so these are people that we would call algonquin speaking nations right that would be all the way from canada all the way to virginia so from the powhatan nation on up to the micmac and the um ojiba way and all these people Technically, they're all Lenape people. They're just known by their location names. But they speak a form of Algonquin, right? So we know this history to be a part of who our nation is, right? Because of the sheer fact that we're where we at. We can, like, we have languages, like, the study of the language alone can verify certain things. The fact that so many people in North America speak a form of Algonquin, which is really a French word, and I could tell you how it came to be named Algonquin, you know what I mean? But that's a, that's another build. But just know that it's a French word that they, they learn from the Algonquin tribe, which is a specific group of Lenape that lived in Canada. When they when they arrived there, they arrived at a certain place called Algonquin, which in the language means like close to the water or on, you know what I mean? It's just a location place. So when the Europeans met these people at this place, they named the language that they were speaking after what the people told them, this is the place you're at, right? So they called the language Algonquin, right? But that's not the name of the language. The language would be called whatever you call yourself, right? So the Muncie speak, people speak the Muncie dialect of Lenape, right? The Wunami speak the Wunami dialect of Algonquin, right? The Wunachalatigo speak their dialect of the same language all the way down to VA, all the way up to Canada. So we'll all have 
we all speak a similar la language, but it's slightly different. I'll give you an example. In the Munsi dialect, thank you is Anushik, right? In the Wunami dialect, thank you is Wanishi, right? When you're familiar with the language, you can see the similarities in Anushik and Wanishi, okay? So and then like as you keep going up, terms change, but it's still the same language, just different dialects, right? So on up to Rhode Island, all through that, they're all Algonquin speakers. In all reality, they're all Lenape. The one in Jersey, the, the group in Jersey, which was the original homeland we settled, still retain the name Lenape because they still lived in Lenape Hokan, which is land of Lenape. But those that moved out took on other locational names. All right. So now let's go back to the beginning of the migration, which takes place, which like our nation historians will say started off in Siberia area, right? Now that's where my nation starts to record their history in terms of migration. But if you wanna go back further, now you have to go into the history of mankind. Right. Because at some point. We weren't recording the history. Whether it was orally or whatever, it's so far back, we're not it's not on record. So if you talk to someone who's of Lenape ancestry, the story is going to start in the Siberia area. Mm -hmm. But I know by studying humanity that before the people who are in Asia, Siberia, before they were there, they come from a group of people that were in another place. And they come from a group of people that were in another place that will trace all the way back to what we call Africa. Now, this is something that took place over thousands and thousands of years. A migration is not packing your stuff, walking from one place to another and settling. A migration is moving out, settling in certain areas, then the population grows big, and then you keep moving and more and people move out. You leave, there's a whole population of people that stay, and there's others that branch out and move out. Process keeps repeating itself. And this is how you establish communities all across the globe. Because people are humanity is growing, right? Having babies. You buy a house, you got six kids. You buy a house, you got no kids. You buy a two bedroom house. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, you got six kids. You got <laughs> a bigger house. Or the older ones got to move out. And that's how migrations happen. It's not people just walking to a place. We're going to go here and we're not going to stop walking until we get here. That's not how it happens. Right. This is how the globe was populated. And there are certain genetic tests there are, like, this is what DNA is really about. DNA is not about being able to say you're from Africa. That's how they're using DNA against us. DNA is there to be able to trace migrations of people. And when people move from one place to another, right, when they've been in another place long enough, they mutate. And certain markers are created genetic markers in you. So if you come from a tropical area and then you move up into Europe and you've been there for a long period of time, you're gonna have mutations in you that are gonna leave markers. That hold that thought, hold that thought. That's why a lot of people say don't get DNA testing because it doesn't necessarily prove your whole ancestry. No, that's not what it's for. It's to prove where aspects of you of your ancestors, it helps them figure out where the people were at certain parts points. Because when these markers, when these markers develop, let's say they develop in Europe, a specific mark will be developed in your genes, and that gets passed down to your children, which gets passed down to their children. So now, ten thousand years later, that marker that was that came about because of the environmental conditions 
found in Europe and you're living there for so long that you adapt to it, that mark is still going to be left in your genetics. Mm -hmm. So 10,000 years later, when your great, 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 all the way grandchildren are now living in Australia because migrations are based on population growths and people having to move. So now thousands of years later, you got people in Australia, right? That have the same markers as the people in Europe. That just shows there's a connection between those people. It doesn't mean that those particular people in Australia owe anything to the cultures and everything in Europe. It doesn't mean that they're sons to them, even though they are genetically offspring of them. They're still their own separate people that develop their culture in that lane. And guess what? Being there long enough, they develop markers that reflect that environment and mutations that reflect that environment. So these can trace migrations of people. And that's what DNA and genetics are really for. Not to prove what tribe you're from. It'll never prove that. It'll just prove that. Well, I agree, but uh, people are under that impression. But that doesn't matter what you don't know. It and they make it final. But that's the thing. None of this changes the truth. So do we align ourselves with the truth or what people who are misinformed think? Well, that's what you said. They, they're they thinking these are experts and you have to be that. And that's your final DNA marker. And you can't be from any, you know. No. And that's because they're not, they don't comprehend what's really going on. And this is right. what we need to settle. All right. So you have, you have, so, so now that I laid out what, how migrations can be traced through genetic markers. No. All right. And please, everybody, please look this up, go into it for yourself and get great gain an understanding of what this DNA this stuff is really about. So now when we go into that, right, that's how you scientifically can, can prove migration stories. Now, I'm going to go back to something. There's a post I did last week, all right? So I want to show that what we call the out of Africa theory, right, which is a theory that was created or hypothesized in the early 1900s, a hundred years after the Lenape told European historians our migration story. So in 1832, a book is released called the Wallum Olum, and it's about the Lenape migration story in which we told them where we came from, what direction, what route. This is before any genetic science is available. Before DNA, 1832, they're not doing the things they're doing now scientifically, right? So before they knew about being able to test genetic markers and determine migrations, mm -hmm. long before that, right, these people knew about the migration patterns. So once they developed the technology to be able to say, let's see if we can verify what these people told us. That's where the so-called out of Africa theory come from. It comes from European scientists trying to validate what tribal nations around the planet have told them in regards to their creation myth. It don't come from their minds. It comes from them hearing what we say and trying to validate it. Because these Migration stories were being told hundreds of years before any genetic, before uh, anthropology existed, before ge geology existed. You understand? Like these professions, these sciences did not exist. They were invented recently in the 1900s. Genetic testing is like 50 years old. But the genetic testing that they have verifies what our ancestors told them hundreds of years before they had the technology to verify it. So where are these theories really coming from? It's like also with the Dogon, right? You have the Dogon in Africa, right? People will say that, uh, like getting off the topic, but this is an example, the flat earth theory, right? 
they'll say the earth is flat and NASA been lying to us. Well, guess what? NASA got the model of the universe from the Dogon people who had it for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So why are you wow. giving NASA credit for the, for the diagram of the universe when indigenous people gave it to them? Right. And everybody goes, NASA's lying. Well, is the Dogon lying? And why would they lie? Because none exactly. of the information that Europeans are getting credit for is their information. They just develop technologies to verify it. Exactly. And when they release their findings, that's what they do. Simple as that. Like, it's not them. And then another thing about the whole out of Africa theory that they say, what's wrong with the theory is that it happened much earlier than they say. That's why people go, yo, they found bones in America that's 200,000 years old. And it's older than bones they found in Africa because they're wrong about the development of mankind. They're not wrong about how it happened. They're wrong about the time frames. And people will tell you this all the time when it comes to Egypt. Oh, no, them pyramids is way older than they say. Right? They're not saying the pyramids don't exist. They're saying they're older. Older. Well, the, the information that these Europeans initially gave us is flawed because the dates are wrong not because the science is wrong and people are using that to say oh it's been debunked no the times of these have been debunked but the actual phenomena of migrations have not been debunked it's the timing it's when it happened it's who it was like they'll tell you that the uh the clovis people migrated here and they were the first mm -hmm. but they'll show you white people Mm -hmm. That's what's wrong. So, right. so black people, right, these pseudoscientists will realize that, oh, no, this Clovis shit is wrong. It's not that people coming here is wrong. What's wrong about it is they told you it was white people from Europe. Right, right. That's the error. That's what's been debunked. Not that it happened, who it was. So everything that has been done by our people, the European takes it, and rewrites it for itself and gives us to it, gives it to us. Yes, and the shit they put on it can be debunked, but the truth that it come from can't. Right. No, NASA did not teach you about the uh, model of the universe. We got it from the Dogon. Now, the Dogon are the priest cast of Kemet. They're the ones that know how they built the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Europeans still can't figure out how they built the pyramids. The Dogon could tell you. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Just like the, the the migration stories that people, that the European is called the out of Africa theory, they come from tribal migration stories. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's crazy because people will believe in Atlantis, but won't believe in something that's been genetically, scientifically verified. Mm -hmm. But they'll talk about Atlantis. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And nothing in His terms story. Of, yeah, nothing in terms of what they tell us about Atlantis has ever been verified. Mm -hmm. And if you do find cities at the bottom of the sea, it's only because the water levels of the planet rise and fall. Mm -hmm. At some point, the cities we live in now might be underwater. Mm -hmm. only because of the rising and falling of the sea level, not mm -hmm. because there's some sinister thing that people are hiding from us. Mm -hmm. New Jersey at one point extended out maybe 10 more miles. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? At this point, the shore is not where it was when my Lenape ancestors was living their true culture in New Jersey. The mm -hmm. shore extended out hundreds and hundreds and, you know what I mean? Not miles, but like, you know, my, it's, it extended much further. That's different now because of the water levels. And right. scientists and these people with the technologies, they know these things. Oh, yeah, it's purposely done. Yeah. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that when we talk about certain things and we, we give credit to the European as being the one who introduced these sciences to us, they not. 
they just developed a science to verify what we say. You know what I mean? The reason why they think there's a lost tribe over here, because some tribe somewhere told them that. Where would they get these ideas from? Exactly. See what I'm saying? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're getting interpretations and histories from people all over the planet, and now they're trying to put it all together. And right, tie it right. all together into a book, which is the Bible. Right, right. But, you know what I mean? Even the Bible, like another thing, like when we talk about, me and Pa talked about it yesterday, when we, they talk about the Adam and Eve gene, then people will say, mm -hmm. well, the Bible says there was people on the earth before Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just told you earlier there was 13 different species of humans. Species. Adam and Eve were the first to mutate into Homo sapiens sapien. What? They're, they're, that gene represents when the Homo sapien sapien evolved into the people we are now, modern man. It doesn't mean, Adam and Eve doesn't mean there was nobody before them. They are the first of a specific type of people, which we would call modern man, who we all descend from. So when they find different bones all over the world that are older than the Adam and Eve gene, it's because there are different species of people that we are not. Right, right, right. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and brings me back to the same point I was making. And science teaches us that Homo sapiens sapiens came from a specific place. And that would all have to do with the environment and things of that nature. You know what I'm saying? Now, as far as people saying we found bones here that are older than the bones there that's fine those bones are not homo sapiens sapiens and if they are homo sapiens sapiens all it does is push back the story of the migration see people want to give up the planet for one part i believe it's all of this planet is everyone's planet all of us that are here because we're the ones that survive yeah like we're only here because your ancestors survived there's whole right. other families that don't exist no more there are there are people who don't didn't have kids somebody died off young and now that whole line is gone mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying the whole whole bloodline is gone your bloodline is here because you survived Mm -hmm. millions and years of evolution why are we trying to take that away from ourselves you see what i'm saying we are the people that travel the entire planet right there's someone that has a question for cheetah paw um akim aline i have a question for cheetah paw why do i hear that many africans say that they are unaware of the African slave trade until they come to America or interact with Americans or American history? It all depends on what African they ask you. Yep. It all depends on what African they ask you. Yep. There is a, um, I'm, I'm gonna find it. There's a term for that. I'm gonna find it. What these people are doing, it's it's called incredulity, incredulity or something like that. Basically, what they're saying is you ask somebody, right, have you ever seen such and such? And the person will go, no, nah, I ain't never heard of it. That doesn't prove it doesn't exist. That just proves they never heard of it. So to ask an African if you ever heard of any slave trades, first of all, when we talk about 12 million people over a period of time being taken from Africa, you know how many people are in Africa? Well, it's different countries, yeah. Exactly. It's right. billions. So 12 million is a big number to us. But when you're talking about the whole population of an eastern part of a continent, that might be 50 people from here, 50 people from here, so on and so forth. It's not like they took 12 million people from one nation. You understand? Right. So why would these people have these in-depth records, regular people? 
Now, if you talk to the leaders of the nations, they'll know that's why Ghana and Nigeria, whoever, issued apologies. But why would the average family from a African tribe who, like their village might have never had to deal with anybody being taken. So if you ask them, they don't have the credibility or the historical context or records to even ask that question. You're asking the wrong people questions. Let me ask, let me ask the person that asked me the question. Do he know about the prince of the food of Jalan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are documented, these are documented cases. Do do he know about the Prince of the Fruit of Jalan? The person that asked me that question, do they know about the Prince of the Fruit of Jalan? I'm trying to see if he's writing. Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman. Rahman. Right. The Prince Slave in America. African Muslim Slave. Apparently not. He's not responding. That's all right, but here is reference to what Pa is talking about. Okay, let me let me give a little bit of history. Mm -hmm. Okay, about Rock, he was a prince of the food of July. Okay, that will be right there around Morocco. Okay, the Treaty of Morocco actually got him out because what wound up happening is when he had been, him and his master went to like a, a flea market in other words mm -hmm. and so they saw him write Arabic and his master was like what you know about writing Arabic because he's supposed to be a slave he ain't supposed to know about how to write and read and everything so while he was in the marketplace a doctor that was on the savannah hunt out there in Africa in Food of July recognized him because the prince saved him. So what happened is they wrote a letter to the president and they got to write the letter to the emperor of Morocco and that's how they was able to free him. Now, this is another thing. He went on campaign to get his family free because he married a Chickasaw woman. He had children by a chicken saw woman. Okay. Wow. That's the part that they're not talking about in the book. But he had children and everything, and he was trying to get them free. Okay. They gave him papers to go back to the food of July, but he died here trying to free his family. And you know, you know who else helped him to travel around the Northeast and everything to speak about him being a slave and stuff? Guess who helped him? The oh. Prince Hall Masons. The Prince Hall Masons. Up north. He went to go speak at one of their lodges. Yeah. They helped him to pay for money and everything to do his road trip to speak about what happened to him. Like he got in this now, can you type so, any of that in? No, not on my phone. But they can look the information up. This your show still will be up, so they can look it up. I don't know if Norris could type that for me. What, what do you he need? Type a little bit of the uh, his name and where they can look it up. Who? Amon oh, the prince. Listen, of, yeah. the prince he, he, he could start just by just by googling African prince enslaved in America. Okay. Like. Yo, Google is so, it's damn near child friendly. If you have a thought, just Google your thought. <laughs> and Google will bring you back some information that can help you. Just, let me just say this. When you Google things, mm -hmm. if it's a WordPress uh, website, don't put too much uh, 
like don't put too much into it because anybody can create a word plus a word a word plus word press what is it wordpress anybody can create that that website what you want to do is you want to google things you want to ask questions and you want to go to creditable sites if you ask a question and you can choose between what a WordPress has to say about it and what the Smithsonian has to say about it, start with the Smithsonian. Start with what they have to say. And then if you want to start reading the, the WordPresses and just anybody who wants to put something up, go ahead. But ground yourself in what science and what people from creditable uh, organizations, people who have been peer reviewed, and throw away the whole they're lying to us we can't trust them if you can't trust them then don't ever get on a plane again don't ever get in the car you understand don't eat the foods you eat because all the foods are processed by these people matter of fact if you like see what i'm saying like everything we do has been given to you by people right that use utilize certain science and technology Right. The same people that you don't want to empower or you don't want to believe we're on their technology right now. Right. The same people were trying to hide things from us actually gave us the Internet where we can go find all these things that they've so-called been hiding from us. Mm -hmm. So all that victim shit and I can't find my history and all that because they burnt, they ain't burn shit now. Just because some shit burnt down don't mean the real information is gone. Oh, Lord. It, 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 it just means that you got to be a little more clever on how you access it. And don't be so satisfied with what you want to hear. You know what I mean? Like I said, if you want to believe that African Americans are the real Indians, you can go to a WordPress website and get all the information to verify. Right. But what you're going to be doing is running around here regurgitating people's opinions. If you want to believe the Underground Railroad didn't happen, you can go to a particular person's website and you can listen to that person talk all this craziness about it not existing. Right. Or you could Google some creditable resources and not only go to the places where these people hid. You can talk to descendants of these people. You can go to whole communities, and guess what? I'm one of them. See what I'm saying? So when we start to, when people start to hold themselves accountable, you're going to hold others accountable. And then you're not going to let somebody just say anything to you. You know what I mean? Like, we just let people say anything they want to us. No, you cannot say that to me unless you bring me actual fact. And I don't need your interpretation of the facts. Show me the facts. I used to tell people, you don't got to sit at this person's feet. You can go to the library because everything he's telling you, he got out of a book. Mm -hmm. So why do you need his perception or interpretation of information when you can go get it for yourself? You see what I'm saying? Hey, look, 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 I just pulled it up. That's why I wish I could get this camera. They say an African Muslim prince goes to Boston in 1826. They say uh, Muslim history of uh, the Lord, uh it says that he went to Boston uh, afternoon on uh, August of 1828. David Walker, an African American merchant, civil rights activist, and fierce. Uh, abolitionists uh, discovered the intense toast of a banquet in honor of Abdul Rahman Ibn Ibn Saw of West Africa, a Muslim and prince who had been enslaved in the United States for 40 years. So they held, they held a banquet in Boston at a mm. Prince Hall Lodge for this man. Mm. A Prince Hall Lodge. It goes on to say, now a free man is a part of the result of the direct interest of the president, John Quincy Adams. Okay. Amon Rockman arrived in the East Coast City as part of several state journeys to raise money to free his children and his grandchildren from slavery. Mm -hmm. Having already purchased his wife freedom, 
he now wanted to reunite the rest of his family so that they can all deport to the country together for a new start in Africa. The prince traveled to Boston by way of a steamboat and stagecoach, right tirelessly on practicing all the ways of the Quran Arabic skills he preferred in Africa. He perfected in Africa while he was a young boy. Aman Rahman knew the showcase of his skills that could lead to opportunities to help him free his family. His early Islamic training served him well before why one of more times. After all, a letter he opened in Arabic two years earlier quoted a passage from the Quran. He led a series of fortunate events coming to his own freedom. During Aman Rahman weeks, Long visit to Boston that summer, nearly 200 years ago, the African American community there rattled around his mission to raise funds for his family freedom. They considered him to be a fellow countryman and a great noble patriot. They say some of these men took out their daily routines to escort him around the city. They also felt him with grand fashion. 50 of the most respectable colored citizens of Boston have associated themselves together for the purpose of giving the African Prince Abdul Rahman a public dinner tomorrow. The Salem Geese and Newberry Herald reported on August the 19th of 1828, but the influential citizens of color did not stop there in the support of him. They also organized a celebrity parade for the prince to immediately proceed to the dinner. They say around 4 p.m. on August the 20th, 1828, hundreds of Boston's African American populated march completed with a band and a chief marshal for the parade. From the African school house, the since the existence of African meeting house on Bacon Hill. All right, to the African Masonic Hall, because remember, Prince Hall had the Masonic Hall, that Prince Hall African Lodge and everything, which was located in Cambridge Street. Amongst the participation, the headdress and tailors and laborers and waiters and handcart men and barbers, just to name a few. It is the African Masonic Hall where the banquet was held, and a song created just for Abdul Rahman was performed and David Walker gave his fiery remarks and support to the freemen. So, so you had an African prince that was enslaved. And, boy, he and where did you find that information? Oh, the information is found at the Muslim History Detective. That's the Muslim name. History Detective? Yes. Because some people said it was choppy. Yeah, it is, it was done. And it was done on February the twenty sixth of two thousand and fourteen by Precious Rashid Mohammed. Okay, I'm so, yeah. I'm gonna let you guys go. Um. Well, I just yeah. want to say one thing. Are you guys planning on writing a book together? Oh, you know, Pa can write his. I like, I'm, I'm working on an interactive book. My book is going to be a series of uh, documentaries, things of that nature. You know what I mean? But I will say. Well, you know, a lot of people ask me about writing the book. I say I am the book. You are right. a book, right? Writing the book now, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, for folks and, and that I don't know, um, to my children. <laughs> for folks that don't know, um, Norris is all he's a filmmaker as well, and he does documentaries. And uh, Norris, can you tell them your website? Okay, my website is turtlegang.nyc. Um, there you can find uh, a lot of my work. 
Uh, I have multiple documentaries on um, indigenous history and culture concerning my family in particular. A documentary called When is an Indian Not an Indian? When he's a Negro. I actually have a series, have about um, probably like a seven part series of different videos that uh, deal with that topic. Um, so check my website out. I have a plethora of videos on other old pages that showcase indigenous culture all, all over the world, not just uh, native culture. You know, I work with a lot of uh, a lot of lecturers, a lot of you know respectable people. I've done work for universities. Some, you know, a lot of stuff you need you know special access to actually view. Uh, so, you know, I, I've done a lot. I plan on being a little more active um, moving forward and trying to, uh, you know, help reset what's going on in, in terms of this conversation. It's a personal conversation to me. And um, I feel uh -oh. like Cheetah Paw, um, I didn't mean to cut you off, Norris, but he's saying, um, Akeem, that asked the question. Um, he's saying, let me clarify, the reason I posted that question was not that the slave trade didn't exist. It was to highlight inconsistencies with the slave trade narrative. That's why he asked you uh, uh, the question that he did. See, this is the thing. Per I mean, let me just, I'm going to speak real quick and then pop. I don't think there's inconsistencies in the narrative. I think people have a problem comprehending what they're reading. I think people don't like, they, people tell them things and then they read the narrative and the narrative doesn't align with what they've been told. But you've been, you're being told these things by pseudo scholars. And that's where the inconsistencies come. There's never been, like these records, like when you look up census records, they're not new. These are old documents. When we look up these documents for real, they're not new. The inconsistency is how people interpret them and how they switch it up. See what I'm saying? Like I said, somebody will say, where are the slave ships? There's no slave ships. That could be considered an inconsistency. You understand? But the right. truth of the matter is there are ships. This, this is where the problems arrive. People aren't comprehending what they're reading and they're not getting it from sources that are have our first-hand sources you know what i'm saying can people who are around at the time like people really wrote books about slavery during the time of slavery why aren't you reading those books the, the inconsistencies there are well, none he um, also says um if the african slave trade happened the way it happened then instances like that shouldn't occur. What? Why not? Uh, well, um, the Africans not knowing about, I guess he means about the Africans not knowing about the slave okay. trade here. So, Which Africans? Why would every African know about the slave trade? You see, yo, when did we learn about it? As a whole, in depth, after Roots. Does that mean because these people didn't learn about it, it didn't happen? No, that's false logic. That is not scientific. And that's the problem with the conversations that are being had. He said, if, like, if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk. You see what I'm saying? These are circular questions that are geared to be able, for somebody to be able to pull the bottom out. Just because people don't know about something existing doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means those people you're asking don't have knowledge of it. As I stated, Nigeria and Ghana both apologized for their role in, in the, uh, Afri the Atlantic slave trade. Now, if whole nations apologized why are you basing what you believe on somebody who doesn't have the knowledge of what went on? See what I'm saying? Like, this is what I mean. People just are stubborn and they want to believe what they want to believe. There are no inconsistencies 
in this narr narration, in this net narrative. The only inconsistencies are how people interpreted it. If I guarantee you, everybody, if you go back and watch Roots now, you'll see a whole different film than you see. What you'll see is that Kunta Kinte was the only African. Mm. You'll see that Kizzy, right? Kunta Kinte's wife told the child, you gonna have to learn that from your father because my people didn't do that. Mm. You're gonna see in the movie where they talk about the difference in textures of hair. It's just that when we were watching the movie, many of us were not aware of the historical inaccuracies that we accepted because everybody running was around here with talking about, everybody running around here talking about their grandma said they was Indian. Then why wasn't you talking this 10, 20 years ago? Well, a, foot, a footnote of history about that movie, um, Alex Haley wasn't allowed to put um, his Cherokee heritage in the movie. Probably wasn't. It wasn't his story. <laughs> but that doesn't make it like a valuable tool or resource. Everybody needs to watch Roots again. It might be a hard watch, but look for what you... Mm -hmm. Look Look for the little clues I'm talking about. And you're going to see. see uh-huh. He was the only see, one on the plantations that was a Muslim. They laughed right. at the Kente throughout the movie because of his ways. Right. right. And if you remember when he was talking about Africa, she said, I ain't no Africa. I'm yeah. from here. I'm from here. So like, that meaning her family was an Indian. That right. they enslaved. And they purposely See, made they him keep that out, they out, out of the book. Um, they purposely right. made they him keep it out of the uh, movie. He wasn't allowed right. to put that in there. But because but look at the place, look at the place where it happened at. It thing. happened in South Carolina. If you're yeah. clever enough to know what you're watching, you're gonna pick these things up. And that's right. what people need to do. They gotta step their game up. Your comprehension game is down. I'll pick it up so you know what you're <laughs> seeing and you know what you're reading. And I'm sorry if that sounds what there's a book, Daughters of the Dust, as well. Yeah, the Indian African <laughs> connection. Yep, there's a movie they can watch the movie, something. Daughters of the Dust. Me and my wife watched look, it one night with her father. Look, what people don't fail to realize what do they call the Oscars? Mm -hmm. What the Oscars is for, they call it what. The Academy of yeah, Arts Academy and Sciences. And sciences yep. Don't you know by them being the Academy, which dealing with academia, arts, and science, meaning that they have to put the movie accurate enough to where you think it's just sheer entertainment, but they give you bits and pieces to your psyche. And the people looking at it just sheer entertainment when they're telling you that, oh, he was at the bottom of the slave ship speaking Arabic, praying in Arabic, and say, I mean. Then his daughter was named Kizzy, which is named after a tribe that's in Ghana. And then, like, what part you don't understand? What part codes. you don't get? They give you codes in it. Codes. The white boy, The white boy wrote the movie, and he plagiarized it. Do that mean that the movie is a lie? Well, how did you know that he was supposed to be a Mandinka? That's a real tribe. But you see, that's another thing. People will say, oh, Roots was fake. No. Part of the story that it was Alex Haley's was the lie. That don't mean the entire... That's, that's what they call throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Because find one inconsistency in how the story is being told, you're going to say the whole story is a lie. No. The the fallacy in it is that it was this man's story. That don't make what they're trying to convey to you in the story a lie. You understand? It's, it's like people I'm yo, mm -hmm. people do not want to be intellectual enough to understand the intricate aspects of history this shit is not simple it's not like easily digestible you got to cut it up can't do it with no emotional pieces. mindset either 
You can't be emotional. Yeah, like you can't be emotional. You got to cut it up into small pieces so you can really digest what it is you're taking into your psyche, into your mind. But people aren't. They want they want it to be easy. People don't want to be burdened with the like the burden of proof is on you. If you say you're this, you have to prove it, and you can't prove it by saying I'm an, I'm a Native American because all black people in America are indigenous. So I'm a, I'm Native American. I'm not going to tell you my tribe because that don't matter. I'm not going to show you my connections to the tribe. That don't matter. The color of my skin makes me native. I want my land back. That's what people are trying to do. And they're trying to throw away, okay, I don't want to, you know, if the African slave trade never existed, I don't have to prove I don't have African in me. See what I'm saying? Like, it, it's... People are trying to take the easy way out. If Pan, well, no, we were all here on the planet when Pangea happened, and then when the continent split apart, we surfboard to the other side of the, of the planet on a continent that's moving. What? For real? Now, okay, let's look into the science of Pangea. It says Pangea, first of all, is a theory that was created in 1915. So that's no more valid than the out of Africa theory if we're going to say theories aren't valid. But what we need to understand our theories is theories are based on science. When a scientist says it's a theory, it's based on science in fact. That's very different than a theory of, I think my girlfriend cheating on me because I called her and she didn't answer the phone. Then I called my boy and he didn't answer the phone. So they so did it get together. That's not a scientific theory. That's just what you think. So people are mixing up scientific theories with opinions and they're arguing scientific theories with their opinion no scientific theories are based on facts they're only called theory because they're still working through them but enough of it is based on facts that they can start putting things together get what i'm saying but no people want to weigh their opinion versus a scientific theory it did it did if the African slave trade didn't happen, then there would never have been no uh no Negro slave laws of Virginia, of North yeah. Carolina, South Carolina, and Louisiana. Yeah. And yeah, why did the why did the Moors have separate laws for them? Like it's so, like this is another thing. When people take something away from you, they should replace it. If you're gonna take somebody's religion, give them another religion. Just don't take the religion from them and leave them empty. Right. So if you're going to say these things didn't happen, you have to be able to fill that void with as oh, much wait. information as you just took. And you just hit it right that. there. You just hit it right there, Norris. Here it is. Why you think the Moors had to come out with the Sun Dry Act? Because they was enslaved. Yep. And that's when they say, hold on. Oh, I say we was going to What year did that act time. come out? What year did that act come out? Did it come out in the 1700s? Let's look it up. I'm going to show you something. The sundry, right? The sundry, what was it? The sundry. Sun, the sun, the, the, yeah, the sundry, the South Carolina sundry act. Moors from sundry act. It happened in the 1700s. Okay, let me, because let me, this is what I do all day. If I'm thinking about something, I grind, I grind myself in the actual fact of it before I speak. So, South Carolina. Sun Drive Moors Act. Okay. So here we go. 1790. Just as I thought. You know why they had a law in 1790? Because in 17... 74 or 5 at a convention in Philadelphia called the Odd Fellows Convention, right? Which is what you see on the back of a $2 bill. And anybody that wants to say that man on the back of that $2 bill is black, that $2 bill painting is hanging in Philadelphia and it's 20 feet by 40 feet. The original is not on a little thing, it's huge. 
and you can see clearly who these people are. None of them were black. So all these people talking about that man was a black man and this and that, they're lying. <laughs> and if they and if they care to come with me to Philadelphia, I will take them to the original painting that is bigger than you, bigger than a human being. So anyway, let me get back to the story. So the Odd Fellow Convention is where the Europeans were drawing up the Articles of, of Association. Those Articles of Association lead to what we call the Declaration of Independence. It's where these Masons, who are going to be the founding fathers of the United States, were plotting against the king and queen because they were about to revolt. So they had to have this meeting under the disguise of a convention when really it was all the movers and shakers, the players that would be known as the founding fathers were coming together because they were getting ready to draw up plans to separate from England. At the same time, they were declaring that, you know what? We don't need the Moors help no more. We're going to strip them of their turbans and sandals. And in 200 years, they won't know who they are. And this is documented Morris science. This is what the this is what inside of the uh, temples. This is what the Moors talk about. I got this directly from a grand sheik of temple number 11. Rest in power. He's no longer with us. But I have it on film where he talks about when the Moors were stripped of their nationality in 1775 which is why 15 years later they had to be protected under a law. Because prior to that, the Moors had a status in America that was different than so-called slaves. Slaves, uh -huh. exactly. Because look, that, here it that's is That's why right this here. happened in 1790. And here it is right here. They say the state record of South Carolina. Listen, they say the state record of South Carolina, the Journal of House Representative of 17... 89 and 1790. Michael E. Stevenson, editor, and um, Charlemagne M. Allen, um, assistant editor, published in South Carolina Department of Archives in History by the University of South Carolina Press, Columbia, South Carolina, copyrighted 1984 by the South Carolina Department of Archives in History. First edition published in Columbia, South Carolina, the University of South Carolina Press, manufactured in the United States of America. And it said, uh, there to old committee of Mr. Hughes Reshnews, a uh, major packet in Mr. Dean, uh, by order of the House of Jacob, reader, speaker, and uh, order that the message be sent to the Senate that Mr. Hughes ruled and the dean to be carried the same. The House of the present to be second in reading of the bill incorporated of the Baptist Church of Holmes Creek in Ennefield County in South Carolina uh, when the motion was made and second the bill by the order of ordinance by sent to the Senate that Mr. Simpkins and Colonel Anderson do carry the same as in the House adjourned until tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Okay, they say on Wednesday, January the 20th, 1790, they say to read in the journals of yesterday proceedings. They say it was a whole proceeding that they had to do. Okay, but yet it goes on how they spoke about the, um, the petition was present for the House of the Sun Drive, three moors subject of the emperor of Morocco and residents in the state praying that the case they should commit any fraudulent assembly to be brought upon justice and they are subjects to the prince in alliance with the United States of America may be tried under the same laws as the citizens of the state which was ineligible to try and not under the Negro Act, which was received in red. So right there, they let you know that, hey, we are not under the Negro Act. We're not under the Negro law. Norris, when so, you go to um, Philadelphia, can you take a picture of that portrait? I can. It's online. You can just Google it now. Oh, yeah, they got it online. Oh, 
But yeah, I'm going to read, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a read this to you. 1774, 1774 Articles of Association, which is what I just, well, talked, I just about talked about in terms of uh, the, the laws that were changed, that were changed. what was going, on at, what was going on at the time. Can somebody turn their own? Mine is down. Mine is down. Turn yours down a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to turn mine down. down. All right. All right. So, 17, 1774 Articles of Association. On October 20th, 1774, the First Continental Congress adopted the, associate, the Articles of Association in response to the intolerable acts. The British government had imposed on its subjects in the colonies. These punitive laws were passed in response to patriot uprisings in the North, particularly the Boston Tea Party in late 1773. The Articles of Association proposed a boycott on goods produced in Britain and its colonies and also provided for the correct conduct of colonists during the boycott. So this is what is laying foundation to the American Revolution, where these Europeans said we are no longer going to answer to Britain. And remember, Britain had treaties with the indigenous nations, right? So when they revolted against Britain, they also revolted against the indigenous nations that had been giving them refuge, that gave them religious freedom and the right to live free of religious persecution. We gave them that in 1654. First parcel of land ever sold to any European in North America took place in Monmouth County, New Jersey. And we did it. Treaty. No, or it was, treaty. no, this is, no, 1654. Oh, okay. 1778. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, no, this was the first land deeded to any European, and it was deeded to them so they could live uh, free from persecution of religion. Mm -hmm. That's what they really were here for, mm -hmm. right? And at that point, this was before William Penn's treaty, okay? So the same people that the indigenous nations helped now in 1776 they're declaring independence from britain but that's also mean they're declaring independence from the treaties that were holding them accountable so at that point is when everything went crazy because now these colonists at one point they had an answer to britain so when they would get out of hand in the colonies you know what britain would do they would send police officers over here and the police officers would come over here to police their own people because they were raping and killing native women. They were abusing the treaties. So when they talk about the red coats are coming, the red coats was coming to help us. But because psychologically we are under these people, right? And we have accepted their narration. When we hear the red coats are coming, we think it's a bad thing. The red coats were coming to enforce the law, which was the treaties. What's the what's the main law on any land? Treaty law. Right. See what I'm saying? So, like, this is why Crispus Attucks, who was a half um, native, an African man, was who they say was the first person to die, basically in the revolution, up at the Boston Tea Party. Why did they dress? Why did Europeans dress up like Indians to throw tea off the boat? Because they wanted to create a rift between the two parties to divide and conquer. Britain and the native nations here had a agreements. We was in business right. together. So now, if they can make it look like the Indians violated the treaty, of course, it causes problems. Divide. That and was the white masons that became known as the Order of the Red Hand that did that. Yes. They were also known as the Odd Fellow. Right. Which is a Masonic order. Right? So a lot of like like Britain didn't betray the indigenous nations. A lot of our first nation, first contact nations have treaties with Britain. 
See what I'm saying? So we don't have to go to the United States to get recognized. <laughs> we got treaties with foreign nations before you existed. And you know what? And you know what? And those treaties that was done with England was grandfathered inside the United States Constitution, yeah. Article 6. Because look yeah. what it says. They say treaty that was made before yeah. and after this said government shall be the supreme lord of the land. So you got to yeah. ask the question, what treaties was done before the United States? It was those treaties with Great Britain. Mm-hmm. Yep. And this is we're not, talk, know talk, to get this we're not talking about the uh treaty of peace and friendship by the Moors. We're not talking about that. That was way before that. Way, way before, before that. That's why the Lenape Nation has the right to create a state that was a part of these agreements. And we the Yamasi had the treaty, had like one of the first treaties yeah. with Queen Anne. You know what I'm saying? Said, but it said this is the land yep. for the Yamasi forever. And why why Queen, Queen Anne was so instrumental? Because Queen Anne was the daughter of the king and queen. Right? But remember, these are original people. And they wasn't with all that slave trade. That was not Britain. That was the colonists. Like, this stuff is way deeper than people think. And if you're just reading books, right. you're not going to get the little nuances that bring it to life. Right. So these weirdos are sitting here saying, and I don't even want to say their name, but these weirdos are sitting here saying things didn't occur. Atlantic slave trade didn't occur. This and that. But they're not talking to you about the real information that empowers our people. You understand? They're only telling you things to make you feel like you're owed something. And to get you emotionally charged up so you can spend right. money with them. Norris, someone wants to know where is the documents that say they were stripped the moors of their sandals? I just told you it's in the articles of of association. Well, he, he didn't care. He didn't. Um, this is someone else named Gerald. He didn't catch what you uh, say uh, as far as where you could find it. Look up the articles of association, but you have to be knowledgeable of legal legalese talk. They're not going to say it how I just said it to you. <laughs> you understand? It's going to be within a law, it's going to be within uh, law, legal leads. It's going to be, you, you, you got to understand what you're reading. So if you just have a, if you're coming, if you're reading certain documents without a background in the language, you're going to miss it. But it's called the Articles of Association. Who are we associating ourselves with? You understand? The Listen, the Moors had a, oh my God, this shit is so easy. The Moors, right? And you can find this in history. They had agreements with Europe, with Britain. I'm going to break it all down for you. You can look into all these, uh, the Barbary Wars, all that stuff. And you can understand that the Moors were exploiting European nations. Anything that came on a boat, the Moors was running down on and taxing them. It was the captain, right? Yeah. So these European nations had to make treaties with Morocco. And you know so, who was the you know who was the emperor at the time? Bula Ishmael. So anything that was moving in the open waters, the Moors was taxing, getting a piece of it, right? So Britain coming to the Americas, they had to go through the moors because they controlled the oceans. The Atlantic Ocean, so, right. So Britain had a treaty with Morocco, with the moors, right? Now, when Britain, when the colonists who were under Britain revolted against Britain, they now were not responsible for the treaties with the Moors. This is why the Moorish Morocco was the first nation to recognize the United States. To reach States. out to them. Because wow. they 
said, okay, we was getting money with Britain, but them people revolted against Britain. And we still want our money. So right. we're going to enter into another treaty with the United States now. So we, can still, right. so we can still get our money. And that's what the Treaty of Peace and Friendship is. Yo, right. this history is so interconnected. And if you don't 1787. Have, yeah, if it's look at the dates. It's all lining up. See what I'm saying? The colonists revolted against Britain. We're not giving you no money. Now Britain can't give Morocco no money. So Morocco's like, all right, forget y'all. We're going to go straight to them. And they reached out to the United States. And the acting president at the time sent Charles Barclay to uh, Morocco to work out the deal. And he was there for two weeks. Okay? Let me tell you something. The emperor of Morocco found out about the French revolution. Found out about the revolution in America via a French newspaper. Mm -mm. He right. didn't even know what was. He didn't even know what was going on in the Americas. So when the Moors talk right. about, oh, the more the Moors was controlling America, the emperor didn't even know that the revolution was happening. And when right. he found out, and they realized they was going to be losing money, they scrambled. To get in touch with these people so they could set up another treaty. So that's why Morocco was the first people to recognize the United States because they wanted that money. They got cut out of a deal by George Washington. And guess what? And guess Morgan. what? Here's, a, here's, another, here's another fun fact. Who was the king of France at the time when the French Revolutionary thing was going on? See, they told you in the movie. The Pirates of the Caribbean, High Tides. He said, told Jack Spicer, he said, he is the king of England, the king of Ireland, and they left out the king of France because King George was also the king of France. And he was the holy treasurer of the Holy Roman Empire. That's how you know the Holy Roman Empire was the fail. He was the one that paid for both sides of the American Revolution. So it's it's a lot of information. Like I said, this, this information is complex. It's not simple. Like these people just be trying to oversimplify things so they can make claims. But them claims ain't going to fly around people who really know what's really talking about. That's why all these people who think they're experts, you won't never see them sitting down with no tribal people because they can't humble themselves. Akeem has a question. This is for both panelists. What do you think about archaeological findings of pre-Columbia Negroid people like Lucia, Nala, and Aplana? Okay, so that's cool. I just did a post. Well, no, I didn't just do the post, but I brought it to the forefront because I knew this might be something that comes up. So I'm gonna, um, let me just go to it so I can be exact. But those are absolute real findings. But guess what? Lucy is not Homo sapien sapien. She's not. She's not modern man. All right. And a lot of these findings that they're finding. And first of all, all these forms of human beings in their original form, they would have been considered what we call black. Even Neanderthals. You can go to the museum here in D.C., and you can see the sculptures. You can see them all. All these people would have been considered in today's term as black. So all, yeah, all these bones they're finding, they're absolute true, and they're humanoid bones. They're just not homo sapien sapien. Okay? Lucy and all those old bones, they're not modern man. It's like you got different kinds of terriers. You have Boston Terriers, and you have English Terriers, and you have Pit Bull Terriers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have a bus of nine. All right, this is yeah, something I did. But even if, even when you look at the, um, when you look at uh, Naya, right, you see she has an Asiatic look to her. You know what I mean? She looks very similar 
to the people of color you would find in the regions that we call Mongolia. Why? She looks very similar to the people we would call the Khoisan people. Why? Because the Khoisan people are part of the second migration that brought mankind around the planet. The first of which was the Twa people. Then the Khoisan. Look at Naya and look at a Khoisan person. They look identical. After hundreds of thousands of years, they still look identical. So, yes, all that is actual. Our people are right. migrated all over the planet. Right. Norris, Paul, when are you guys coming back on the show? <laughs> We've been going over uh, three hours and 20 minutes. And it's been wonderful. Will you want us back? <laughs> uh, you tell me. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah. In, uh, I'm, free, I'm, free, I'm free on Saturdays and Sundays. Well, we'll talk about it. My schedule is a little hectic. You know what I'm saying? I just happen to be free today. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll, 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 we'll figure You're something out. You know what okay, I mean? dear. I'm going to say good night. Right. Um, good night. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I, uh, you got to be regular panelists on here and historians. It's been awesome. Thank you for having us. Uh, once again, I'll uh, let people know uh, a little bit about uh, your web page and far, let them know a little bit about what you're doing before we sign off. Okay, well, like I said, uh, my website is turtlegang.nyc. Online, um, anything Turtle Gang, anything Turtle Gang NYC, it's gonna lead you to um to my work. Turtle Gang Edutainment gonna lead you to the work. And on Facebook, uh, you know, I go by my real name because I'm transparent. I don't got nothing to hide. Mars Francis Brown. And Paul, well, I was on Blog Talk, but since my cousin made a transition, it's been on Facebook ever since. So you can find me on Facebook. So now, now you said this. You said this is going to air on your channel as well. Well, I was simultaneously. Uh, oh, okay, that's cool. On YouTube, but uh, well, I'm I'm going to sign off. I'm getting tired because my head is swelling up with knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, history is key. Research is key. Love it. Got to be it. Love you guys and tribal members and, and, and nephews. Mm -hmm. Love you too. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> what we do? We do. <laughs> this is Fiber Gray Wolf of Native Voices Turtle Island TV. And we'll see you soon. Until then, All don't right. adopt the honey. Night, family. Night. 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 Thank you, Wado. I hope.